its 10th year as the world's leader in motorsports coverage presents Speed World. We welcome you to Darlington Raceway in South Carolina for live coverage of the Trans South 500 stop number five on the Winston Cup Tour for 1989. A beautiful day, relatively cool temperatures, but the sun is shining brightly. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins. They used to call this track the Lady in Black. More recently, the track too tough to tame. It has had a reputation of being tough on equipment ever since it was built, and it was NASCAR's first super speedway. There is a new dimension, however, today here at this track that could make it even more tough on equipment. It's not necessarily a new problem. We've had it for about a year, but it could be as serious today as it ever has been for a Winston Cup race. For an explanation, let's go to the pit area and Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, Bob, let's give the people at home a clue. They're round, they're black, and I'm standing in a big circle of these things. They're called tires. And again, it's the tire war that's heating up, but it's a different kind of tire war. It's not a war between Goodyear and Hoosier. Actually, it's a war between the tires and the racetrack. The track is very grainy. It's very, very sandpaper-like, and the crews are complaining there's a lot of grit on the track. It's literally just wiping the tread off the tires. They're very, very concerned the tires may run no more than 35, 36 laps, certainly not a full fuel stop, which will be seven laps and to make matters worse let me show you what's happened back here they're out of tires all these wheels are stacked up here and Goodyear brought almost 2,000 tires there are none left the cupboards are empty here at Darlington so the loneliest people in the house the Maytag repairman of sorts will be the Goodyear tire busters they're gonna sit here all day and watch the race but the big concern the drivers have whatever they have now they're gonna have to make do the car owners are concerned. They've spent $15,000 a piece, some of them more than that already on tires. They'll have to finish third or fourth just to pay their tire bill. They're really concerned here. They're going to roll the dice and figure out who can go the distance here on tires. Ned? Jerry, that's a far cry from 1959 when Jim Reed went all the way in winning the Southern 500 here on one set of Goodyear tires that cost about $200 back then. I think it's going to take a chassis working perfectly here today, and Benny Parsons, a driver, running very smoothly on the racetrack, trying to conserve those tires as much as possible if they expect to have a chance to win. $200 for a set of tires? Yeah. Man, with if the money in racing today, if these guys could get by on one set of tires worth $200, they could get rich. I think today that the, it is going to be an experienced driver because they're talking like a set of tires will only last 75 miles. And you would think an experienced driver could tell when those tires are worn out, come in the pits and get some more tires. But the unexperienced driver, he may stay out there and catch a caution flag. Jack Root it might make a difference on who has the most nerve. Well, Benny, remember when you were young, experience was one thing, but enthusiasm played heavily in the way you drove. And that may stand in good stead for the first four cars here on the starting grid in the Trans-South 500 because the average age for these four starters, headed by Mark Martin, is a little less than 31 years of age. And when it comes to gambling, when you've got a lot less years under your belt, you tend to not think so much about things and tend to roll the dice more. And with the tire situation, that may be just what you need to do to make it to victory lane. All right, Jack. Well, there is indeed a young upfront grid that begins today's race. There are 41 in all that are ready for 367 laps around this 1.3 mile oval, 500 miles in the Trans South 500. Today's Speed World coverage is being brought to you by CarQuest Auto Parts Stores. You'll find it at CarQuest. By new Right Guard Sport Stick from Gillette. Antiperspirant and deodorant. Anything less would be uncivilized. By Ford and your Ford dealer, have you driven a Ford lately? And by Quaker State Motor Oil, the big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. We'll be back in just a moment to introduce the starting grid for you as we're set to go in this afternoon's Trans-South 500 from Darlington. If Winston Cup drivers are assembled at Darlington, South Carolina for today's Trans-South 500, and we welcome you to what should be a great afternoon of auto racing. Here are the point standings after four events in the 1989 season. Dale Earnhardt is atop the list with 680 points. Second is Alan Kowicki, then two-time winner Darrell Waltrip, Sterling Marlin fourth in points, and Jeff Bodine is fifth. In sixth, also a two-time winner, Rusty Wallace, and in seventh is Rick Wilson, followed by Ken Schrader, Michael Waltrip, and Rick Mast. And all the way down in 16th position is the defending Winston Cup champion, Ned Bill Elliott. 
Yes, and he has not been as consistent as Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt has been a model of consistency so far in the first four races this year. He has three-thirds and one second-place finish. Even though he's a guy that likes to win all the time, he said at Richmond after finishing up there, he said, I might just second and third him to death this year and go ahead and try to win the championship. And I tell you what, Bill Elliott, what a tough break he caught at Daytona this year. Broke the wrist, the second practice. And he's not been the model of consistency because last year he was a steady winner. This year he hasn't led a lap. Jerry Punch is with him. We're only in the fifth race of the 29 race season and it, it's hard to believe that people are saying it's a must win or must get a good finish day for Bill Elliott, but it's almost that way. You feel like you got to get this thing turned around if you're going to be able to defend this championship. Well, I don't think it's a must win. I mean, we can only do what we can do, but the way the situation started out the first of the year, you know, the thing of it is I've missed a couple of races and I've really not been able to do what I need to do. And, you know, there's no miracle to this sport, you know, and the thing of it is these guys have gotten ahead of me, you know, working out the 89 stuff and we, we fall in behind. We're tearing up two cars at Daytona and everything else. And it, it's just been a tough season. And, you know, being away and, and not keeping sharp is to me is as important as anything and still not being 100 percent as far as what you do inside the race car makes all the difference in the world. How is the wrist? Are you 100%? You've had to set up the car conservatively in the past, you told us, and you really couldn't attack the racetrack. Can you attack it today if you want to? Well, I'm going to try to, but I still don't know if I can or not. I got the car a little out of shape here yesterday and had to use my left arm a little more than what I wanted to, and it it's a painful situation, you know. But there again, it just takes weeks to get your muscles back in shape from being used to running a 500 mile race and it's no different than anything else this is hard to bounce back i guess after any injury you know and get back to 100 percent you know in a short period of time it just takes time to get it worked out we'll let bill elliott get in the race car he's starting 13th today and as one of the crew members said it's about time for bill elliott with all the injuries we've had to stop bleeding and start leading and maybe he'll just do it here today at darlington bob well, Bill Elligan hasn't led a lap so far this year, and leading a lap is important. Had Rusty Wallace led five more times last year, he would have won the Winston Cup, and Bill Elliott would have finished second. Here is the starting lineup for today's Trans-South 500. On the pole will be Mark Martin from Batesville, Arkansas, in the Strolite 40, qualified at 161.1. The car number is six. Then, Brett Bodine, the number 15 motorcraft Ford. Brett is from Shemung, New York. Starting in row number two, it's Alan Kowicki. In car number seven, the Xerox Antifreeze Ford. He was a pole winner at Atlanta. And then comes Davey Allison from Hueytown, Alabama, driving the Texaco Hamilton Ford, car number 28. Going to row number three now, it's two-time winner Rusty Wallace from St. Louis in the Kodiak Pontiac, car number 27. And then the Daytona pole sitter, Ken Schrader from Fenton, Missouri. He'll start in sixth position in the Folger Chevrolet, car number 25. Starting seven, another two-time winner so far this year in the Tide Chevrolet, car number 17, it's Darrell Waltrip from Franklin, Tennessee. Outside will be Jeff Bodine from Shemung, New York, and the number five, Levi Garrett Chevrolet. He won the pole for the Richmond race last week. Starting in ninth position, his best start ever in a Winston Cup ever to the Hardy's Pontiac, car number 28 from Hickory, North Carolina, Dale Jarrett. And starting 10th will be Harry Gant, the number 33 Skull Bandit Oldsmobile. Harry Hales from Taylorsville, North Carolina. Starting in 11th position, it's Dale Earnhardt, the current points leader. And number three, the GM Goodwrench Chevrolet. He's from Kannapolis, North Carolina. And then comes the Conover, North Carolina driver, Morgan Shepard, who'll be behind the wheel of the number 75 Valvoline Pontiac for this afternoon's contest. Starting in 13th position, it's Bill Elliott and Lake Speed. Number nine on Elliott, 83 on Lake Speed. The eighth row will be Bobby Hillen Jr. in car eight and Greg Saxon, number 88. Going to row number nine, it's Rick Wilson in four and Ernie Irvin in two. Tenth row, Terry Labonte in 11 and Neil Bonnet in number 21. The 11th row, 55, Phil Parsons in 71, Dave Marcus. Row 12, 30, Michael Waltrip in 66, Rick Mast. Going to row 13, it's Ricky Rudd in 26 and Sterling Marlin in 94. 52, Jimmy Means in 84, Dick Trickle in row number 14. Ben Hess and Kyle Petty make up row 15, while Jimmy Horton and Eddie Birchwell will start in row 16. In the 17th row, Richard Petty, he's back, and Ken Bouchard. The 18th row, Rodney Combs and Larry Pearson. Starting in the 19th row, it's Derry Cope in 68 and Jim Sauter in 31. In row number 20, Hutt Strickland starts in 57 and J.D. McDuffie in number 70. And all alone in row number uh, 21 will be Chad Little in car number 90. 
Let's go down now to the uh, starting lineup where Janie Fricky, a popular country western singer, will have the command. Gentlemen, start your engines. cameras there is Dale Jarrett as he's positioned in the Hardy's Pontiac getting set for the competition here this afternoon we wish him good luck and all the other drivers that will provide the entertainment for us this afternoon on this Sunday afternoon in South Carolina we'll be back for the start right after these messages Today for the Trans South 500. Activity here at Darlington in preparation for today's race began on Thursday. Jack Aroot brings us up to date on what's happened here the past three days. Bob, all the action got underway in earnest on Thursday when 35 cars took time in first round qualifying for the Trans South 500. And they were led by 31 year old Mark Martin and his Ford Thunderbird. Flanking him on the outside was another Ford. In the second row found two other Fords as well, leaving many people thinking that Ford may stand for first on race day. On Friday, six drivers passed their mandatory rookie test here at Darlington and second round qualifying was held as well but the big story was the development of tire problems here many crews worried about excessive wear hustled back and forth between the garage area and the racetrack testing and trying to find a way to make the tires last and King Richard Petty made it into the field he'll start 33rd and it left just as a memory the fact that he didn't start at Richmond Fairgrounds Raceway one week ago then yesterday Jeff Bodine went from pole to checkered flag to win his Bush Grand National Series event his his first of the year but the big story was Robbie Moroso's ninth place finish that garnered him the points lead he stays in the lead there in a race by the way that was the first held this year that was not marred by controversy of any sort a good clean fast race so that's what's happened in the uh, previous three days here at Darlington but now we're just moments away from the start of the headliner the Trans South 500 now, you remember last race we did, we had the crew cam on Jimmy Maycar from the uh, Rusty Wallace team. Well, Jerry Punch can tell us who's wearing our crew cam for today, Jerry. Well, we can expect some outstanding shots today. This is David Smith, 38-year-old jack man for Dale Earnhardt. He's from rural Hall, North Carolina, and a two-time All-Pro. Yes, in, in, in the NFL, they have an All-Pro team, and likewise in racing, and David's a two-time All-Pro. And David, the crew cam today shouldn't hamper you at all. You should give us some fantastic shots of those four-tire changes. Well, we really hope so. Uh, looking forward to it. We'll go out and play in the traffic for a while and see what happens. But, yeah, I'm excited about it. hope we get some real good shots for everybody at home today so they can see what I see. It gets pretty hectic. We'll see him slinging that jack around those four tire changes. We already mentioned there's going to be a lot of tire changing going on, and he will have us up close and personal here on ESPN as the crew cam comes to the Goodrich crew and David Smith. All right, we'll look forward to that crew cam, but we do have two in-car cameras, and here we are in the Hardy's Pontiac that will be driven by Dale Jarrett today, and Dale certainly enters this race with a lot of hope and a lot of confidence because it's his best start ever in Winston Cup competition. He did have a good qualifying run, and he's doing it without a full-time crew chief this week, Bob. Uh, Elmo Langley, who had been the crew chief on the K.O. Yarborough Motorsports car, quit now, and he's, with, he's driving the pace car today, and we'll be working with NASCAR. And we our other in-car camera will be carried by Morgan Shepard of the Valvoline car. There you can see that he is uh, right behind the uh, Skull Bandit, driven by Harry Gant. And Morgan Shepard will be carrying our second in-car camera for the afternoon. Having a few breakup problems there, but we'll get that corrected. Harold Kinder signals one more time, and we'll get the green flag. The track, too tough to tame. It's a 1.366 mile oval. Actually not a true oval, it's egg shape with the larger turns being three and four. The pole lap time was 30.523 and the speed 161.111. The length is 367 laps and if what we have seen in previous days is any indication, they'll only able to be going about 30 to 40 laps before having to come in for a tire stop. It looks that way. The people are concerned that over 50 laps this early on in the race. I think once the race gets going, the tire wire will pick up somewhat. A moment ago in Dale Jarrett, we had the face cam, the camera inside the car. We saw him working his left foot. He was working the brake pedal because those brakes are metallic. They have to be warmed up 
there we see that he's not working the brake pedal right now, but just a moment ago, he was warming those brakes up because they have to be warm before they work really well. There we see him just a little bit. Now he's going to shift gears. As the crew, the uh, field rather, is between turns three and four, and Dale is anticipating a start. You can imagine what's going through his mind right now as he begins to uh, accelerate and come off of corner number four to take the green flag and the start of the Trans South 500. We're glad you're with us. We hope you have a great afternoon, and here is the green flag. The race is underway. So many crews have been talking about the Mark Martin car and how strong it has been the past three days. It has the lead right now. The battle for position is between Davey Allison in car number 28 and Rusty Wallace in 27. Davey has fourth place. Rusty is back to fifth. There is the third place car, the number 15 of Brett Bodine. Completion of lap one. It's Mark Martin leading by about five car lengths over Alan Kowicki, then Brett Bodine, Davey Allison, Rusty Wallace, Daryl Waltrip, Ken Schrader, Jeff Bodine, and Dale Jarrett as they down the back stretch for the second time. Mark Martin got himself a pretty good lead on the start of the race. He was certainly not only the fastest in qualifying, Bob, but he also showed tremendous speed here yesterday in the last practice. Only one car is starting this race on Hoosier tires. That's the J.D. McDuffie car, number 70. Everybody else is on Goodyear's. Dale Earnhardt is uh, situated back there in a pack of traffic and trying to uh, pass. Harry Gant right in front of him. He's made a couple of attempts to pass Gant, but just hasn't had the room. And right behind Dale Earnhardt is Morgan Shepard in car number 75. Look at Dale sneak right up on the back bumper of the 33 car driven by Harry Gant. Here comes that group of cars off of corner number four, the group being uh, led by Daryl Waltrip. Noticed Harry Gant a little bit loose there in the third and fourth corners, but now he is down below Dale Jarrett in turn number one and about to take that position from him. Indeed, Harry Gant grabs the position from uh, Dale Jarrett, and here comes Dale Earnhardt also, but he'll not be able to make that pass down the back stretch and into three. If Earnhardt's car is handling like it normally does, right now is when he'll make his move. Yes, here he comes. He's on the inside of Jarrett, and he has position. Jarrett has no chance but back off, and that's for 10th spot. And now both Lake Speed and Morgan Shepard are moving to the inside down the straightaway to try to pass Dale Jarrett. And there is the way it looks from Dale Jarrett's point of view as Earnhardt is right ahead of him. The Hardys race cam with the pictures. And there goes Morgan Shepard in car 75 going into 11 spot. Here comes Lake Speed in car number 83, the winner here a year ago. Dale Jarrett was a little bit concerned that his car might be a little too tight at the beginning of the race, pushing up on the racetrack a little bit, but he felt that it would work for him as time went on, work to his advantage, but right now he's losing positions as a result of it. Once again, our view from the Hardys in car. As Jarrett has Bobby Hillen Jr. down to his left. Into turn number one, a tight groove there. There's only room for about one race car you can see how Dale had to fight the wheel to stay in the groove and not lose control. i tell you what, he had to fight that wheel to keep control because he got a little bit loose getting in that corner. Up high, the car has a tendency to do that. Dale Jerry, good job saving the automobile. Now Greg Sachs in car number 88, who was slow getting off the starting grid. We thought there might be a problem with that car, but he did eventually get moving and now is running right behind Dale Jarrett as the number four car of Rick Wilson is also right there. Meanwhile, up front, it is Mark Martin and Alan Kowicki running in first and second positions. Rusty Wallace has gone into third, passing Brett Bodine, who's running in fourth spot. So Mark Martin showing the way here in that stroll light forward in the early going. Alan Kowicki, several car lengths behind. But Kowicki has gained a few car lengths just a little bit ago. He was about twice that distance behind. So Kowicki, Mark Martin, as fast as he is, he's not getting away from Kowicki and Rusty Wallace coming up. We're going to have a race in a few laps. Look at Earnhardt making a move on Harry Gant. Taking the position away from him. Earnhardt is on the move. Yesterday in practice, he was very, very fast. Dan, have you ever saw anybody in your life get through three and four any better than Dale Earnhardt? And look, Harry Gant trying back on the inside. Have you ever seen 
anybody get through three and four any better than Dale Earnhardt. No, he can really do it. He knows how he wants the car to work to be able to get down on the inside of somebody, just sort of squeeze him up to the wall and, and move right on around him. He's a master at it. That comment, Ned, that you mentioned that he made after the race at uh, Richmond about second and thirding them to death this year is quite interesting. Naturally, Dale Earnhardt would love to win some races, but again, the NASCAR point structure rewards consistency as much as winning, and he could conceivably win the championship just by doing that. It is possible to win it and not win a race. No driver wants to do that because they didn't, wouldn't feel that they were an absolute true champion, but consistency is the key. Earnhardt once again looking on the inside of Schrader and right in front of Earnhardt is Kenny Schrader. Right in front of Schrader, Darrell Walter. Right in front of him, Jeff Bodine, the Hendrick stable out of Charlotte. Those three Hendrick cars are running uh, right behind each other and there is Earnhardt trying to move to the inside of one of them, the 25 Folger Chevy driven by Ken Schrader. But look at Harry Ann, he's also tucked right up under the back bumper of Dale Earnhardt. They move into turn number one once again on the 10th lap. Now Earnhardt side by side and smokes the tires a little. I'm yeah. telling you, Earnhardt's going to the front as hard as he can. He's driving very aggressively for <laughs> it to be this early in the race. Looks like he's not trying to second and third him to death today. He's trying to win. So that battle settles down for the moment and Mark Martin is very settled down as he has the lead and is showing the way with no problem here with 11 laps gone in the 367 lap Trans South 500. Back at Darlington in the Trans South 500 where the number six car driven by Mark Martin has a lead over the seven car of Alan Kowicki and the 27 car of Rusty Wallace. Well, Jack Aroot now can update us on what we think is going to be the story of this race, tire wear. And as a result of concern about tire wear, Bob Jenkins, a lot of the crews have set their cars up a little bit, maybe a little bit differently than they would normally. I talked to Steve Meal, the current crew chief of our current leader, and he said they set the car up to be just about neutral, but already it's beginning to get a little tight. Alan Kowicki and Rusty Wallace, who have also begun to close, they have set their cars up towards the tight side as well. But Meal said that he's talked to, to, to uh, his, his driver, Mark Martin, and said, let's just set a set steady pace. And here's why. The concern is with tires, as we said, and the crew chiefs were all instructed at the driver's meeting to the fact that if there is not a caution flag before lap 35 to 40, NASCAR will put, them, put one out so that all the crews can get a good, hard look at these tires. That's how concerned everybody is about these. Let's go down to Jerry Punch for this report. Well, Jack, that's exactly what the crews wanted this morning. They talked to NASCAR at the driver's meeting, and I'm here in the Dale Earnhardt pit, and Richard Childress and the rest of the Goodrich crew said, look, our driver is going to drive the car hard no matter what, whether there's a bricks on the car or what. We need to check these tires at about 40 laps. That's what I said, okay, here's what we'll do. If you have a caution in the first 15, 20 laps, it may not come in. But if we, have a, if we don't have a caution in the first 40 or 45 laps, we'll throw a yellow flag, bring all the cars in, let you take the tires off, take a good hard look at it to make sure they're not going to wear and we're not going to get somebody hurt. So that's what NASCAR is concerning. All about safety here, that early caution around lap 40 and 45. A change of leader, it is Alan Kowicki who has moved into the front-running spot, and Rusty Wallace has moved to second, dropping Mark Martin, our pole sitter, and early leader back to third. And it looks like that Rusty Wallace and uh, Alan Kowicki now are set up to battle for that position. Rusty looked like he wanted to take away going down the backstretch. We'll see what happens this time. Yeah, he would like to get in the lead and get a five-point bonus for leading a lap. Do that as early as he possibly can. It's only fitting that these two fellows will be leading the race because these two cars, folks, are the story. Well, there's three cars. It's the story of 1989. If Darrell Walters' car was in that hunt, we'd have all three of them. It's amazing how well the Xerox Ford of Alan Kowicki has performed. He could very well have won the first, uh, the three of the first four races this year with a little bit of luck. As it is, Kowicki comes into this race second in point standings. Now Rusty Wallace is going to try to take the way, lead away from Allen. They come off of corner number two and roll down the back stretch, and Rusty has the lead, but he'll have to cross the stripe to get credit for five points. Looked like Allen got a little high coming off of turn two. Rusty dipped down on the inside, took advantage of it, moved into the lead. And here comes Wallace off the corner, and indeed he does lead lap number 22. So five bonus points now to Rusty Wallace. That's Chad Little, the rookie out of Spokane, Washington, right in front of Rusty. And I imagine Chad saying to himself, he can't have caught me already. 
There's 21 laps into the race, and he's already lapping some other cars. The number six car, we understand, may be experiencing some problems. He indeed has dropped back here in the last few laps. Let's get the update from Jack. Well, Bobby, you're exactly right, and what they think has happened is a tire has gone soft, and the car is getting very loose in the corners. But again, they're playing Russian roulette, as we said at the outset. Maybe it's some enthusiasm is keeping Mark Martin out there. The crew is ready to come in and service, though, if he comes in, but they keep staring at that 35-lap mark where they'd have a free pit stop. Well, we're approaching that mark right now as 22 have been completed. And there you can see the interval between Mark Martin running in third and the uh, leader, Rusty Wallace, in second place, Alan Kowicki, as both go to the high side and pass uh, one of the slower cars, the number 80 of Jimmy Horton. As difficult as this racetrack is, I don't think Mark Martin is going to let him get away because Rusty Wallace is having to lap those cars first. He's going to have more problems than anyone else, so he's going to be held up lap after lap after lap when we get to traffic. So Mark Martin... He can just ride around right now, and you'll get a caution flag in about 10 or 15 laps. Alan Kowicki set his car up in Richmond to run for long green periods, and he claims that if it weren't for that last caution, he would have won the race. So we ask him after Richmond, do you have a set of tires ready now to run for just 15 or 20 laps? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Darlington is a different type of track than these two tracks, and it's, it's a little more treacherous. So once again, I'm going to go with the same approach. Uh, if it comes down to the end and I'm a little bit too tight, I'm probably going to get a little bit bolder when it comes to loosening the car up. Alan Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin, one of the ASA veterans who are really making a splash in Winston Cup competition. Now we go back in the pack once again and look at some of the action back here. There is Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, and Harry Gant battling for position. And that's for fifth spot. Earnhardt's passed the entire Hendrick Brigade. But you know, a guy who's really having some problems right now is Brett Bodine. He's right behind those cars. There's Brett going down in turn one. He started fourth and right now is running about eighth spot. So Brett having some problems. Well, Jerry Punch has a comment on the run by Brett Bodine. Well, tell me here in the Bodine pit, this car is so loose he can't drive it. And to make matters worse, when a car gets up behind Brett Bodine, it takes air off his rear spoiler and makes the car even looser. The so car number 75, Morgan Shepard, and getting right side rubber early here at Darlington. But Brett Bodine will, will like to have that pit stop coming up, that mandatory caution in about 10 laps or so. Morgan Shepard's car down and away, two right side tires. So our first pit stop of the afternoon because of tires comes on lap number 26 and it's by Morgan Shepard as we now ride with him as he blends into traffic and gets back up to speed. Morgan's car had gotten very loose out on the racetrack. He had dropped back several positions and finally just had to come into the pits. He maybe had a tire go flat as opposed to wearing them out this early. Rusty Wallace is the leader of this race with Alan Kulwicki in car number seven running in second spot. As 27 laps have been completed, Mark Martin is in third. We'll run down the field for you as you continue to watch the action. The Bodine brothers are running fifth and sixth. Darrell Waltrip back in ninth position at the moment. I would say that Kulwicki right now, Rusty Wallace, it's been well documented. He wants to lead as many laps as he possibly can. Right now, Kowicki is saying, okay, go ahead, Rusty, you lead. I'm not accustomed to running up front. I want to watch you, and I'm going to follow you around. But at the end of the race, we're going to race. So Alan Kowicki now in second spot behind Rusty Wallace. Rusty looking for win number three in the early Winston Cup season. Back with more of our live coverage from Darlington Raceway after this. Darlington International Raceway and the NASCAR Winston Cup Trans South 500. We are live on this Sunday afternoon and we're glad you could be here. A tremendous crowd on hand and watching the action involving Rusty Wallace in the green and white car number 27 leading this race and passing Larry Pearson at the moment. And behind him is the number seven car of Alan Kowicki. He is running in second position now. Morgan Shepard made a pit stop a few laps ago, and we asked the question, did the tires wear out or did it go down? And Jerry Punch can answer that for us. Well, Bob, there's a lot of nervous people here in the pits right now. When the tires came off of Morgan Shepard's car, they were like crumbs at a picnic. The ants were swarming around, and the right front tire only had 
one and a half, 30 seconds of rubber left when it started the race. It had four and a half, 30 seconds of rubber. So the tire was completely worn away. The right rear tire had still had three, 30 seconds. So a lot of the crew chiefs now and car owners have walked over to the NASCAR officials and said, hey guys, don't wait much longer than 40 laps. These tires are wearing quickly here early in Darlington. So we got to get a yellow and get these guys in. Well, if they do throw it at lap number 35, that'll come in just two more laps. They have said that it will come sometime after lap 35, but as you indicated, Jerry, it could come on lap number 35 to give these drivers an opportunity to come in and have their tires checked for wear. Certainly, we have seen tire wear throughout the weekend here that is really unequaled at this racetrack. There's Sterling Marlin in car number 94 as we look um, out the uh, rear of the glass of the number 75 car. Now let's get out to Jack Aroot for another comment. Well, Bob, Bob, as they looked at those tires, those crew chiefs, one crew has already decided on this mandatory stuff that they're going to switch to Hoosiers. That was your pole sitter, Mark Martin. Steve Meal sent a guy over. He checked those tires and the wear there. He says, we're going to Hoosiers next time as soon as that caution comes out. Back to you. All right. Only one started on Hoosiers. That was J.D. McDuffie. But we could see some of the other crews go to them on this first round of pit stops. There's Morgan Shepard, car number 75, and Rick Wilson at number four. With those new tires on, he's able to stick down on the inside of the racetrack and moving around. New tires really make a big difference. All right, we have reached lap number 35 and no caution at the moment, but we anticipate one before too long. Well, I'm sure that, that if Jerry Punch could find out how worn the tires was, that NASCAR sent an official down, and NASCAR right now knows how those tires are worn. And they're not going to let these guys ride around out there until someone blows the tire. So as soon as NASCAR thinks it's feasible, we're going to have to caution play. So everybody can get the tires checked and find out how their car is working and how they're wearing the tires. Back up front, it is Rusty Wallace and Alan Kowicki still running very close together, lapping the number 70 car up, J.D. McDuffie. And right in front of these people is Richard Petty, about to go a lap down. Boy, don't you know Richard is wishing this caution flag could be this lap. Yeah, well, he says right why now, why right, Richard? No. <laughs> why didn't they throw it on lap 35? <laughs> wonder if they're going to lap 40. He'll try to stay out there if he possibly can. Well, it's good to see Richard back in the race. Of course, he risked, missed it at Richmond because he failed to qualify fast enough and uh, had a problem during his qualifying run. And he is about to go a lap down at the moment. Let's see. Yes, indeed. Rusty Wallace, the leader, passes him and puts Richard a lap down. That makes 27 cars that are now on the lead lap. And our indication is that the yellow will come out on lap 45. If there isn't one between now and then, we're on lap number 38. Well, there might well be one between now and then because uh, those tires are, are getting awfully worn. And there's a lot of cars slipping and sliding all over the racetrack out there. And many of them want to see that caution come very quickly. It seems to me that everybody's being very conservative. They know that mandatory caution is coming, and so they're just playing it real cool. Of course they are. These people are not idiots. They're not going to ride around there and say, hey, I'll blow a tire before you blow a tire. Let's take it easy, guys. And, you know, they're not racing each other side by side in these corners. We're only 40 laps into a 367-lap race. They're racing smart right now. So we will get another break in before we have that mandatory caution period, and we'll show you who's up front in the Trans-South 500 at Darlington. We'll be right back. Came out a little early. There was a car smoking on the track. Number 10, Ken Bouchard. And uh, the pit stops have been completed as Rusty Wallace, Alan Kowicki, Dale Earnhardt, and Mark Martin all have completed their work. And they're going back on the track. There goes Davey Allison out. Here comes Brett Bodine, Dick Trickle, and Harry Gant. Rusty, rather, uh, Daryl Waltrip whirling out of the pits, as is Jeff Bodine. Bill Elliott, though, remains in the pits. He's there on the left side of your right side of your screen, rather, in car number nine. He was one of the last to come in. Now the service on that car completed, and he, too, rolls back out on the racetrack. So we anticipated a yellow on lap number 45, but it came out five laps earlier than that, and the drivers certainly needed it to come in for fresh rubber. They certainly did, and everyone took on four tires, and we understand that Rusty Wallace might have changed. He started on Goodyear tires. He was leading the race, doing very well out there, but we understand that maybe he changed to Hoosier tires. Let's go to the pits with Jack Aroot. He's there. Well, we're actually right here embroiled in this controversy about the tires. Barry Dotson is checking them over, and there's about 3.30 seconds left on these Goodyear tires, and that, that's the reason they switched to the Hoosiers. So Mark Martin, by our, by our count, Mark Martin and... 
Rusty Wallace, your leader before that, actually took on Hoosiers. Now, Alan Kowicki, Darrell Waltrip, and the rest of the fellows up this end, they elected to stay with the Goodyear. So there's, some drivers are beginning to roll the dice with their crew members, whether it's Goodyear's or Hoosiers. How about at your end, Jerry Punch? What's going on there? Well, the right side tires that came off Earnhardt's car, particularly the right front, this one right here, looks pretty good, actually. Earnhardt would be a good gauge for the Goodyear people on how good these tires are going to be. There's still about a 30 second and a half to two 30 seconds of rubber on this tire, and as hard as Dale Earnhardt was running, it indicates it bodes well for the Goodyear people later on in the day. Right now, they've got to be very careful and be very calculating with regard to tire wear, but Earnhardt's crew, Richard Childers, Kirk Shelburne, and the rest of the Goodrich crew feel pretty comfortable about the way Dale's driving the car right now. So it could be, as you guys mentioned in the open, that it's a car that is set up properly and perhaps Dale's is because he's getting pretty good tire wear. Well, that's right. If there's anybody here who knows how to set up for Darl, then it's Earnhardt. And you would think that Bill Elliott, we see Bill Elliott right there. He has gotten off to a dismal start again today, was running about 20th when this caution flag came out. But one, one excuse, or let me give you to Bill Elliott an excuse, when he broke his wrist, Bill Elliott has built all new cars over the winter. It was up to him to practice and test those cars and get them sorted out. With the wrist, he's not been able to do that. He just now is getting to the point that Bill Elliott can start his 89 season. And it is a uh, big deficit that Bill Elliott begins from this year with that broken wrist. He wants very much to defend that Winston Cup title, but it has not looked good so far. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Sprint, Midget, and Super Modified fans, here's a great deal on the magazine for you, Open Wheel. For only $14.97, you'll get a full year. That's $20 off newsstand prices. Plus, you'll get these free racing decals with your paid subscription. Old-time stories, technical articles, and what's hot in today's fastest cars. Read about the drivers. Call 1-800-453-7800 now for Open Wheel and get your free racing decals. Have credit card ready. 1-800-453-7800. Open Wheel Magazine. You told me about the great jobs in the National Business Employment Weekly. And the help in landing them. And doing better on the job. So I really owe my new job to you. Well. Thank you, sweetheart. Get the National Business Employment Weekly at your newsstand or order by credit card and get eight issues by first class mail for $35. Call 800-332-0300. 800-332-0300. The National Business Employment Weekly. Don't make a career move without it. ESPN is your ringside seat for a featherweight battle between Louis Espinoza and Adam Garcia, plus Olympic medalist Michael Carbajal, as Budweiser presents Top Rank Boxing, Tuesday night, live on ESPN. Rusty Wallace maintaining his position uh, after that pit stop. Alan Kowicki is second, then comes Dale Earnhardt, followed by Mark Martin, then Davey Allison. Now, one guy who really lost some ground in that restart was uh, Ken Schrader. He came in running in the top ten, but he had a problem in the pit area that's put him way back in the pack. Here's Jack Arute, although we do see uh, Ken Schrader moving back up now. Bob, do you see this board here? Well, that's what Ken Schrader has to point to as he comes hurtling down pit road. He did not see it and overshot his pit by about 25 yards. He did have the wherewithal, though, to shove it back into reverse gear and back into his pit stall. So although it was costly, he didn't have to go all the way around. But the crew's none too happy with their driver right now. They said, do we have to get a bigger board? <laughs> Well, I'm sure it is tough to see, especially when you've got uh, cars in front of and in back of your particular pit. It's hard to see it. One of the most confusing things in the world because there's all the colors in the rainbow on pit road, and you're trying to pick out a red board amongst all those colors. It's very hard. Larry Pearson in front of those, those field right now, in front of Michael Walter, Blake Speed, and Ken Schrader. Is that 
Pearson ran the back of someone. He, he is did. a lap down right now. Yeah, that happened a little bit early in the race, uh, Ben, as some cars got jammed up uh, just after the race started, and Larry ran in the back of somebody, so the grill is bashed back in. It shouldn't hurt their running up too much, though. Larry Pearson, car 16, outside of him, the yellow car, number 30, driven by Michael Waltrip. As Ken Schrader is kind of sandwiched in between a couple of cars here and not able to make a move at the moment. Back up front, meanwhile, it is still Rusty Wallace showing the way. Dale Earnhardt now in second place. Earnhardt came out third out of the pits. The Richard Childress crew doing a super job again getting him out of the pits. And he has since passed Alan Kowicki, who's now coming into the picture there. And Earnhardt might be gaining on Rusty Wallace a little bit. And Kowicki might be dropping back from Rusty Wallace. He's not running this one. He's just going to go. You saw 27 cars on the lead lap just as the yellow came out for the tire check. Terry Labonte was about to go a lap down, but the caution flag was very beneficial to him. Jerry Punch is in the Dale Earnhardt pit. Well, gentlemen, Dale Earnhardt started 11th here. We saw him smoking the tires in the first few laps, scampering to try to get in the top five. Well, apparently he was what you call cooling his jets early on. That, that was not what we call aggressive driving, according to Earnhardt. But after that pit stop a minute ago, when Richard Childress radioed him and told him, hey, your right front tire still had plenty of rubber on it, he said, that's all I wanted to know. Look out front, here I come. So apparently now he's going to push the button a little bit. Well, that's the tire that no one that no one wants to blow is that right front. Because watch Earnhardt when he comes off this corner. Right there, if that right front blows, he's going straight into that wall, almost head on. Nobody wants to do that. The right front's the one we got to take care of. The number nine car of Bill Elliott continues to struggle along as the Coors Ford has had a dismal afternoon so far. He lost several positions in that 41st 40 lap uh, period. And now we're inside Dale Jarrett's car, the Hardy's Pontiac, as he is right behind the Elliott car. There's Dale. They have come through about half of that traffic that we see behind them there. They've really had to work to get as far up as they are right now. Bob. They're running about uh, 16th, 17th, somewhere in that area. Man, look at that rush hour traffic. Big Neil Bonnie going by the Sitco Ford. Ken Bouchard there in car number 10 and the 90 car. Now Dale Jarrett is right up on the back bumper of Bill Elliott. Well, he can get a good lesson here from a fellow who has uh, several victories on this racetrack, knows how to get around as well as anyone, so maybe they'll ought to follow him a little bit. When Jerry Punch a moment ago made a comment about taking the air on this corner, that's what happens when Dale Jarrett drives up right behind Bill Elliott. The air wants to go over the back of Bill Elliott's car and not hit that rear spoiler and makes the car extremely loose. In 22 starts at Darlington, Bill Elliott has finished outside the top 10 only twice. Top 10 better than 90% of the starts at Darlington. the line that Bill Elliott is taking there as uh, he's right ahead of Dale. It looks to me like he's running a good line. As a matter of fact, Dale Jarrett ran wide open through three and four. We could hear the throttle. He never cracked it through three and four, and usually that's the judge. If you can get through this corner, through the fourth corner wide open at Darlington, you're running pretty well. And Bill Elliott's staying right in front of him. The line looks good. I don't, the car's just a little bit too slow. I really don't know why. Well, I do know why. It's just the, the fact that he hasn't been able to work it out. But, what problems it would be, I don't know. Still just fascinating for me to watch that in-car camera and to listen to the points that the driver has to get off the accelerator. Up front. It's still rusty. 
Rusty Wallace in the Kodiak Pontiac, car number 27, leading this race. And Jack Arute is down in Rusty Wallace's pit and can tell us if uh, this car is experiencing any kind of problems. It sure doesn't look like it to us. No, and in an era when people are so concerned about weight, this is a little fat baby. This is Whitney, you know, their favorite car that accounted for so many victories. Well, when they put this car on the scale, it weighs about 60 pounds more than the 3,500 pound minimum weight limit assigned by NASCAR. So we started calling the little fat baby down in Atlanta. It's one at Rockingham, and they say it's working well here. And especially with the tire situation, you would think that excess weight would wear on the tires. But it doesn't seem to be the case thus far. There you can see his 89 results. He was 18th at Daytona, but has won two of the other three races that we have had so far in 1989. We'll show you the top 15 as we have completed now 59 laps in the Trans South 500, and we'll be back with more of our live coverage from the track too tough to tame. Introducing the FZR 600 from Yamaha. Don't say we didn't warn you. Ask about no money down financing at your local Yamaha dealer. Today, we're going to find out why America rides Monroe shocks and struts. Sir, why do you ride Monroe? It's the better handling. Oh, says her. Huh? It's the smoother ride. Better handling. Smoother ride. Better handling. Now, less filling. Well, whatever your reason, see your Monroe ride expert for the best ride ever. <laughs> Guaranteed. No wonder America rides Monroe shocks and struts. Fasten your seatbelts. Hold on to your hats. It's time for Thursday Night Thunder. Speed Week starts the evening in the pole position with the most comprehensive motorsports news show ever. Then the madness begins with off-road racing, truck and tractor pulls, mud bogging, drag racing, and live USAC midgets. Every week, enjoy the car-crushing and bone-breaking excitement of Thursday Night Thunder. Only on ESPN. Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Aroot, and Jerry Punch back at Darlington International Raceway. There you can see that the last Pontiac win was back in 1963, but a Pontiac driven by Rusty Wallace, the 27 car, is currently leading. Here's a good battle for position. It involves Davey Allison in car number 28, the Haviland car, and the 33 Skull Bandit of Harry Gant. They've been running close for several laps now. Yes, they have. And Harry has caught Davey, has not been able to pass him yet. Harry, of course, in the car number 33. Davey Allison in the car number 28. Right up on his back bumper. The car behind them that we just saw in the picture is a lap down. But Gant just trying to find a place on the racetrack that he can move under Davey. Maybe this is it. Going for fifth position, and he drives around Davey Allison. Harry with a nice move is fifth. He learned that from Dale Earnhardt in the Bush Ground National Races. <laughs> It looked like an Earnhardt move in the Bush Brown lane. What a good move by her again. By the way, as Jack told you earlier in the broadcast, Jeff Bodine was the winner of the Bush Grand National Race here yesterday in a controversy-free event. Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt running first and second. Dale Earnhardt has not won a race in the 1989 season, yet he is leading the points. And so our question, is consistency the key to winning the Winston Cup title? Well, you got to be competitive and consistent. You, you know, you can be consistent and run 10th or 20th. Uh, now as competitive as things are, but you got to be in, in consistently in the top five and, you know, those top two or three positions in order to try to win races. And, you know, uh, I feel like it's just a matter of time till we do win. We've been close, and just a few uh, uh, little things that, you know, we could have won races already. Dale Earnhardt had a notion to try to take the lead away from Rusty Wallace. He could not get it accomplished, but certainly, Jerry Punch, this car that started 11th and has moved to second is working well for Dale. 
No doubt about it, Bob. We mentioned, you know, that the Whitney's the car that Rusty Wallace is driving, his favorite race car that won four out of five events last year. Well, this is Dale Earnhardt's favorite car. They said, hey, we haven't won a race in 13 different events. The last time we won was on ESPN at Bristol, Tennessee on August 27th, and it was in this same car. So they brought it here to Darlington and said, hey, we're going to take our winner and make it a winner again. And they're running awfully well right now. I want to just mention that NASCAR just radioed down to the crews a minute ago, and because of the heat and temperature here, they are now going to allow an extra man over the wall to service the driver and clean the windshield because of the glare down in turns one and two that will get worse in the afternoon and because of the unseasonable heat here they are allowing an extra man so it'll be six men over the wall plus the catch can man to service for the rest of the afternoon here on pit road all right thanks for the update there jerry so six men over the wall on pit stops this afternoon earnhardt continues to run in second let's go back and check on another battle involving a couple of uh winners Lake Speed won this race last year, and Jeff Bodine was the winner yesterday here in Darlington as they battle for position. They've really been having a good battle for the seventh, eighth, and, and ninth positions. Bodine dropping back a little bit now. Lake Speed in the red and white car, number 83, passed Bodine a couple of laps ago, and now beginning to pull away a little bit. Why is it that some people run good on some racetracks, you think, and and other people don't, Ned. Lake Speed runs well at this uh, racetrack. He likes this racetrack. He says this is his favorite racetrack. Every time he comes here, he says, I get pumped up. He says, I feel that I'm going to win the race. And I think confidence has a great deal to do with it. If you like a racetrack and have a lot of confidence, you know, a lot of people come to this place scared. And I know the first I know time I came here. <laughs> <laughs> I did. But after a while, I built confidence up, and it became one of my favorite racetracks. Not my absolute favorites, but certainly one of my favorites. So Jeff Bodine in the Levi Garrett car, number five, right behind Lake Speed. The 55 car of Phil Parsons. This, these group, these guys are ahead of that group we just followed. There is Phil Parsons in 55, 17 of Daryl Waltrip, and not too far, far behind Waltrip is a 26 car of Ricky Rudd. And that is 9th, 10th, and 11th. Phil passed Daryl Waltrip about 10 laps ago, and I said, well, he's going to drive away from Daryl. But look, Daryl hanging right on his rear bumper. Waltrip. And again, there's, these two people, I think that they're out just trying to feel their car and to find out what's going to happen as the day wears on. They, if they can't lead the race right now, where the ninth place, tenth place is just as good as anywhere. As long as you stay in the lead lap, that's the key factor, is trying to stay in the lead lap, take care of your car, try not to get it in any kind of position where you be in trouble or subject to get in a wreck or get too close to someone because this track is not very forgiving. If something happens in front of you, you don't have a lot of room to maneuver around. The 15 car driven by Brett Bodine started this race in second spot and he is now involved in the battle with the 88 car driven by Greg Sachs. Greg Sachs having a good run here today. He started back in the 16th position, now up in the top 10. We're just working our way toward the front of the pack and giving you the cars that are between the leader and uh, some of those running in the top 10. Did you see all that hair on Phil Parsons a minute ago? I gotta wear a hat because I don't have any hair. It's not fair. Is that why you're wearing a hat when we're doing the stand-up opens? That's right. Oh, okay. I'm trying to be all these technical people have been yelling about the glare. I'm trying to help them out. <laughs> now Never see facts on the inside. Can he make it stick? Nope. Definitely giving Brett Bodine a uh, battle here for that position. A run for the money. Greg Sachs in the number 88 Frisco sponsored car. Whole group of cars in front of Brett Bodine and Greg Sachs. Brett's car is working better now after he made the pit stop. He had dropped back from his outside pole position and uh, dropped back. But now here goes Greg Sachs down on the inside. He might have to move this time, but can't quite do it. So that number 15 car is certainly not performing as well as Brett Bodine had hoped for the second starting position. Jerry Punch is down in the pit area and will talk with the crew chief on this Brett Bodine car. 
Well, Bob, we were Doug Williams, who basically runs the show for Bud Moore. And, Doug, the car not running as well as you had hoped to early on, or you just want to take it easy? Oh, just kind of take it easy right now, checking the tire wear. The car was a little bit loose to start with, and now we got him tightened up. It's just more or less right now. Well, Bud Moore is a veteran here, and he uh, has won races here in the past. His last win came with Dale Earnhardt aboard the car. He's told Brent Bodine, don't use the car up early in this race. It's a long afternoon here at Darlington, and, and the youngster, Brent Bodine, is listening very well to the car owner. There you can see his 1989 performances have not been all that impressive as he was knocked out in an accident in Atlanta and the other three times he has dropped out because of engine problems. So Brett Bodine looking for a good run here at Darlington. The lead meanwhile continues to be held by Rusty Wallace and in second position at the moment is still Dale Earnhardt and Rusty now has a several car length advantage on Earnhardt. We are live at Darlington Raceway in South Carolina for the Trans South 500 and we'll return after these messages. The Trans South 500 at Darlington Raceway continues and Rusty Wallace continues to be the leader in the number 27 Kodiak Pontiac. There he is approaching some of the slower cars. You can see he's led 58 of the 80 laps that we have run so far, and just ahead of him is Neil Bonnet. Didn't seem to matter that he changed from the Goodyear to the Hoosier. The car is still working fine for him. 15, 55, and 17 here. Brett Bodine, Phil Parsons, and Darrell Waltrip. Now the 88 car of Greg Sachs was behind Brett, but this is how he took over seventh position from Bodine. We're talking about the 88 of Greg Sachs. Okay, moves down to the inside, pulls up alongside as they head off of turn two. That was a few laps ago, of course, and makes the pass. And that moved him into the seventh position. Greg Sachs with a fine run this afternoon in the first 70, rather 82 laps of this Trans South 500. Brett Bodine, car number 15, finished 15th in this race back in 1988. Now he has Phil Parsons, Merrill Waltrip, and Ricky Rudd. That is Phil Parsons in the black and white car. Of course, they're about to lap the car number 90, the blue car of Chad Little. Then Waltrip, of course, in the bright orange car, and Ricky Rudd in the green car. Here's the 15 car of Brett Bodine down on the inside of the Ricky Rudd. And Phil Parsons looking to make it three wide going into turn three. They're in room, is there? Oh, and Phil loses it and bangs into Daryl Waltrip. Phil Parsons and Darrell Waltrip in trouble in turn number three. How many times have we mentioned here at Darlington that that area going into turn number three is one groove, maybe one and a half, and there certainly isn't room for three cars, and you can see the result of that. Darrell Waltrip suffers extensive front-end damage to that number 17 Tide machine, and he's headed for Pitt Road as the yellow comes out for the second time this afternoon. Now we're going to have some pit stops, and David Smith is carrying our crew cam. Here comes Dale Earnhardt in for the stop. David Smith rolling the right front tire to Dale Earnhardt. That's Kirk Shelburne, the crew chief, putting the right front tire. Now David Smith drops the jack, picks it up. He'll run around to the left side of the car. He's pumping that jack beneath the left side to pick the car up. He will watch now the left rear and left front tire men put those tires back on. He replaces the one that he puts the jack down and away in 23 and 18 seconds. A great job and some outstanding video there by David Smith, the Jackman. Unbelievable. Meanwhile, there's Daryl Waltrip limping toward the pits. Just a victim of circumstances. He had nowhere to go once the cars got tangled up in front of him. They were just, as we mentioned a moment ago, that track is not very forgiving. Well, Jack Aroot is going to be in the Rusty Wallace pit as the leader of the race comes down for a routine pit stop. Jack. Well, a little bit unusual that Rusty did not pit with the lead contingent. He waited an extra lap. They go to work on the outside tires as another crew member starts to loosen the lug nuts on the inside, the left sides. And they are going to stay with the Hoosiers. So, again, one of the lead contingent electing to stay with the Hoosiers. The car reported from Rusty that it was a tad loose, but they felt that they would still stay this way. Now, they had a little bit of difficulty getting the car up on the jack on the left-hand side but they've accomplished the exchange of tires on the right side and they're just about finished with doing it on the left now and he's off and away meanwhile Dale Jarrett is out of the race and he probably is the guy that that actually caused the uh the caution because he blew as he came down the front straightaway and now you can look at Daryl Walton's damage the front end is blunted 
badly. And then before they can even remove the tires, they're going to have to pry off the sheet metal from the left front. Waltrip takes a drink, and this is a tough break for the winner of the 1989 Daytona 500. To get a good, hard look at what happened to Darrell Waltrip, take a look at this, gentlemen. I'm sure you can show the people what happened. Here we see Phil, my brother, down on the inside. He's going to try to go by Bodine, but Chad Little car is there, and Brett comes down. He has no place to go. He runs Phil on the apron, and as soon as Phil's car touches the apron, he loses control and spins right back up in front of Darrell Walker. And we'll take a look at it from another angle also, Ned. Okay, of course, the 15 car is Brett Bodine, and Phil runs in on the inside. He thought that Phil, I mean, that Brett had cleared the car number 90 and could go high on the racetrack, but he had not cleared him. Spins around right up in front of Darrell Walker. We, they made touch. We made contact. Yeah. We saw just a bit so. of contact, just as it went in turn three. Well, in any case, Darrell Waltrip's number 17 car is being put behind the wall to get that sheet metal bent out so that Darrell can get back in this race and at least gain some more Winston Cup points. Back in a moment at Darlington. Two video NASCAR's greatest Junior Johnson, Freddie Lorenza, Ned Jarrett, Curtis Turner, AJ, and more. Beta or VHS? Call 1 800 992 Video. Hot Racing, Dick Wallen, Stock Car Classics Volume 2, just $59.95. Visa and MasterCard welcome. Call 1 800 992 Video now. Hey, come 500. Today's Speed World coverage is being brought to you by Budweiser. Beat 20 for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By America's best-selling replacement battery, the Sears Die Hard. And by Cooper Tools, the difference between work and workmanship. Field under caution because of an incident up in turn number three involving Phil Parsons and Daryl Waltrip, who was a victim of circumstances, and Jack Arood is with Daryl. Daryl, it won't be your day for a trip to victory lane, but you're going to try and get back out in the race. What happened? Well, the 88 car and the, uh, I don't know, a couple of them, the 88 mainly was taking a lot of unnecessary chances, and I wanted to back off but I couldn't because it was a situation I was afraid we were going to get lapped if we didn't keep going. Something happened. I, I knew it was going to happen. I mean, I, the Lord told me it was going to happen. He said, Daryl, you need to get out of here. But, you know, I was between a rock and a hard place. Either I had to go on and take a chance that everything be okay or, or uh, have happened what happened. This cars tore pretty bad, so we're out of it. We just get it fixed and ride around, get out of it. Get some points. What about the track conditions, though? Are they as bad as we as we alluded to, or is, is it is it as tough out there as we thought it was? Well, he's going to adjust the radio. Oh, I, I couldn't hear you because these guys were hollering at each other. What about the track conditions? It was uh, pretty slick, and uh, we made a little bit of a change, and then it got worse. <laughs> it's pretty bad right now. Well, Jerry punches with another driver that's out of the race. Jerry. Well, after a great qualifying effort, starting ninth in the Hardy's Pontiac, Dale Jarrett exits early. And Dale, you were giving us some great pictures out there, but what happened to the car? Well, Jerry, something happened to the engine there. The, the Hardy's Pontiac was running extremely well, we thought. We were a little loose at the first of the race, and we just tried to hang on to it. We are going to get the caution and uh, come in and make a few adjustments. And uh, We got the car in pretty good shape. We got back in the pack and making the lengthy pit stop to make those adjustments, but we felt like we were in good shape. Uh, coming up through the pack there and uh, you know it's just a matter of time that we can make a couple more adjustments and we felt like that we were going to be in the hunt today. Dale Jarrett exits here early at Darlington. Bob? There is a considerable amount of oil on the racetrack that NASCAR is trying to soak up with the oil dry put down by the boat engine on the Dale Jarrett car. Now let's take a look at the summary of the pit stops that we have just completed. Wallace went in first and came out in fifth position. Dale Earnhardt moved up a position. Alan Kowicki also moved up one, as did Mark Martin. Now, let's talk about something that Jack mentioned. He said Rusty Wallace was having trouble getting the jack under the left side of the car. And Benny, uh, I think you know why. <laughs> well, it's been documented that they switched to Hoosier tires the first time, the first pit stop that they made. The Hoosier tires are a little bit smaller in circumference than the Goodyear. So therefore, when they put them on, the car is lower to the ground and almost too low, almost so low they can't get the jack under the car. 
and that affects the gearing as well. Now, many of them anticipated changing tires, brands of tires, before the race started. In fact, Bill Elliott, we understand, just went from the Goodyear to the Hoosier tires on this pit stop, and so did Sterling Marlin. So they would have a similar type of a situation. But most of them that did plan to change would take the gearing into consideration before the race started. So that explains one reason why Rusty Wallace did come in in first position and go out in fifth spot as we are preparing for a restart in just a couple of laps here at Darlington. The yellow flag is still out here at Darlington because of a blown engine on the Dale Jarrett car and a crash up in turn number three involving Phil Parsons and Daryl Waltrip that has put Daryl's car behind the wall for some repairs. The leader of the race is Dale Earnhardt in car number three and the seven car of Alan Kowicki. Well, Jerry Punch is down in the uh, Harry Gant pit and talking with Andy Petrie, the, uh, the crew chief on this car. Harry's car has not been performing quite as well as it was earlier in the race, Jerry. Well, there may be a reason for that. They planned a little strategy for later on in the race. And Andy, tell me exactly what you did as far as the gearing is concerned of the car this morning. Well, we've been practicing with a 400 gear, you know, in, in practice with these Goodyear tires. And we had the feeling that we may have to go to Hoosiers, which are a little smaller. So to be able to do that, we went to a 391, which turned the motor just a little less with the Goodyear, but it makes it possible for us to run the Hoosier tires. So with the current gear you have, you're, got, you're not going to be able to torque it off the corner because of the Goodyear tires. But if you go to the Hoosiers, you'll get more RPMs and more torque, but you won't have to worry about burning the engine up too much. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, it's not hurting it that much. It's just a little bit. You know, it's, it really doesn't hurt after the tires get hot. Everything's kind of even out then. So a lot of planning going on this morning in the Harry Gant pit. Also a lot of planning going on in the Rusty Wallace pit. Let's go down where Barry Dotson is standing by with Jack Aroop. Jack? Well, Jerry, and you're so right because the planning was, Barry, not to bring Rusty Wallace in with the leaders in the initial few caution pit stops. Now we got a new pace car driver. He's doing a great job. Yesterday they ran a little bit too fast and uh, it made it difficult to get two tires. And right now we're, we're faced with having to get four. So we didn't want to gamble until we have to. There's, there's nothing lost here, a couple car lengths. What about the next series of stops? Will you do the same? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't stand it to come in with the guys that are a lap down. Also, to update you on this end of pit road, they also have elected, believe this, Ellen Kowicki sent guys over trying to get Daryl Waltrip's tires. There's an auction going on behind Daryl Waltrip's pit. That's why there's so many people down there. You know, we've got a correct Darrell Walter a little bit though folks he would kept talking about the 88 car of Greg Sachs and Sachs was not involved in that at all he had passed those fellas and had, had drove had driven away so that yeah. was not the 88 car he might have mistaken it's a light blue car that Chad Little was driving that they were about to lap and, and Darrell probably mistook the color of the car for Greg Sachs but he that's a good point you're probably exactly right Ned I've forgotten the 90 car was out there but it wasn't Greg Sachs Looks like the pace car is going to stay out there on the racetrack. By the way, the new driver of the pace car is Elmo Langley, former driver. Uh, he's uh, in his first weekend of activity, and the pace car is coming out onto the racetrack when there is a caution in turn number three. Well, 10 years ago, one of the closest battles for the Winston Cup culminated at the now-closed Ontario Motor Speedway, and that's the subject of this week's Winston Cup replay. Cup replays are brought to you by the first name in filters, Purolator, exceptional protection for exceptional vehicles like yours. 1979 Ontario Motor Speedway and the Winston Cup drivers are here for the last race of the year. Bobby Allison had won this event the year before in 78. Cale Yarborough will start from pole. He also started there last year. Dale Earnhardt is en route to Rookie of the Year honors. Richard Petty has never won here but will emerge as Winston Cup champ after this race. The number 11 car is Yarborough. Outside that front row is Benny Parsons in the MC Anderson car. The two and a half mile replica of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway sees good racing, but it will only be around one more year. Richard Petty's fifth place finish will give him the Winston Cup title by a mere 11 points over Darrell Waltrip. Allison, Yarborough, Buddy Baker will finish second, third, and fourth, but no one is able to catch Benny. He's already won at North Wilkesboro, and this one gives him his 14th career victory. And was that smile because you won the race or because of the girls? That's well, what I want to know. You know, we've seen all these fellas hit the wall this year, and I, and I said to you, now you know why I quit. <laughs> you saw that picture, now you know why I raced. <laughs> This is Darlington, South Carolina, and the Trans-South 500 will resume our coverage after these messages. 
The caution car still out on the racetrack. We thought we were going to go green last time. However, we didn't. And after 90 laps now, we'll show you the complete field rundown as we get set to go back to racing. I haven't said much about Davey Allison, but he's hanging up there in the top 10. Lake Speed, last year's winner, back in 12th position as the field now is in between turns three and four, being led by the number three car driven by Dale Earnhardt. In second spot is Alan Kowicki. That uh, bright red car on the inside is driven by Ken Bouchard. It's car number 10. Quite a staggered start here. It looks like eh, the pace car is going to stay out once again. So for the second time, the drivers were given the indication that we were going to go back to green, but we're still under caution. The eagle eye camera people for ESPN has found a, a wrench laying on the racetrack, and that's uh, basically a hazard in case someone wants to run. There it is. We yep. see the wrench laying on the racetrack. And we also see a uh, wrecker going to that area of the racetrack. Let's go uh, down to Jack Arood, who's still down in the Daryl Walter pit as they continue to work on that car. Well, actually, Bob, they're working on the car a little further down pit road, and all that's left here is the broom. Time for somebody to sweep up. As you heard, Daryl's going to kind of just drive around. But this right here may be the gold mine for Alan Kowicki, Rusty Walsh, and some of the other leaders. By my count, there are nine sets of brand new tires, lug nuts all glued on, ready to go to the guy that needs them the most. I asked Kowicki's team if they've lusted for these tires that are right next, do next door here, and they said, not only do we want these, we want all that we can get. But the so far, Jeff Hammond has not given these out to anybody, so these could go, as I said before, to the highest bidder before the day's over. So we need an auctioneer down there in that area. Yeah, not just an about. Not an auctioneer, because unfortunately for Kowicki and Rusty, Darrell Waltrip's car is owned by Rick Hendrick. Is, is owned by Rick Hendrick, and he has two other cars in the race. There, the fellow. Oh, they found the wrench. Yep. That's mine, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but pace car is going to stay out another lap, though. So uh, one more to green. I would say the Hendrick cars would get those tires if anyone needs them, right? Yeah, Dad? I would think so. Yeah, they they would have first priority on them. Okay, we've got all the wrenches off the racetrack and all the debris off the racetrack and. Elmo Lang is going to get off the racetrack in just a minute. And Elmo, of course, the, the pace car driver, that's Harold Kinder, the famous flagman of NASCAR. You know, one thing this long caution period has done has helped Darrell Walter put them as they work on his car. It's uh, let them get more work done and less laps being eaten up on the racetrack. NASCAR in the driver's meeting told those fellows to be careful with Elmo. Elmo Lang, a longtime competitor, they said it's been 20 years since he led a lap, so don't run over him out there. <laughs> Next Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you'll be with us once again for more Winston Cup racing. We'll be in Bristol, Tennessee for the Valleydale 500. They have new pavement at Bristol, and we understand that the speeds are up around 122 miles an hour. The track record there is 116. On a half-mile racetrack with a high banking, it's taking about 15 seconds to complete a lap down there. That should be interesting. It's going to be fast, no question about it. Those that have been up there and tested say the drivers had better get their neck in good shape because it's always <laughs> tough on the neck there because of the g-force and the centrifugal force as you go into those high banks you saw there on the scoreboard as the cars pass beneath it that we have completed 96 laps as they come down they'll complete lap 97 and get the green flag there uh, dale earnhardt is the leader second position belongs to alan kowicki third is mark martin harry gant running fourth and the 27 car of rusty wallace is in fifth as the green comes back out driven by Davey Allison. Now there is something flapping on the front end of the 10 car driven by Ken Bouchard. Yeah, it looks like a piece of plastic or something. Maybe it's coming 
from the car. It's almost like if the car was in the wind tunnel yeah. and they were testing the aerodynamics. They might be testing a piece of plastic for some manufacturer to see how tough it is. If it lasts at 170 miles an hour, it's going to be plenty tough. Now that car is so bright today because they have Simon Eyes as a sponsor on that car for this particular race. I guess that's why it's really glowing in the sun here. Oh, so a piece of plastic has caught on the hood pin. Yeah, I won't, I won't let go. I thought I noticed that when they were going around under caution, but I figured as soon as they got up to speed that it would blow off, but it hasn't so far. It's hooked pretty good. Harry Gant hanging right in there in that 33 car. He's got Wallace behind him, but Harry is having a fine run. Yeah, but Wallace got a good run off the of turn two, and he's about to take him going into turn three. Wallace just shot up there like a bullet. Gant slipped a little bit coming off of turn two, and Wallace had good speed coming off there, was able to move around. Only he has not had all that impressive a finishing record in 1989. Several races, he has been right up there with the leaders until something went wrong. That race we did in Rockingham just about four weeks ago, Harry Gant did not have the fastest car there, but was involved in an accident. Let's go down to uh, Jack Aroot, who can bring us further details about this number 10 car driven by Ken Bouchard. Well, Bob, this could be the last time for quite a while that we'll see the 10 car in competition and Kenny Bouchard. I talked to Bob Whitcomb, the car owner, just before the start of today's race, and he said, I've spent about $4 million in Winston Cup competition, and this is the first sponsor that I've had. We hoped that we would have something together with First Brands for the rest of the season. It has not come through, so I'm going to park the car, and I've told Kenny Bouchard I'm not giving him his unconditional release, but if a sponsor comes by and says, I've got to run a driver, if the driver's got the money, I've got to put him in the car. So they're going to go back to the old die guard shop and wait for the phone to ring but we won't see bouchard at crystal or martinsville or north wilkesboro a number 10 car by the way is two laps down in 26. now the 26 car is driven by ricky rudd and the uh, 94 car also close by behind a jeff bodine in the yellow and white car number five ricky rudd in the quaker state car number 26 this team has been a bit of a disappointment to me with the uh Great finish they had in the late 1988 season. I thought they were kind of come on strong in 1989, but it hasn't worked out that way. No, it hasn't. And Lou LaRosa, who was the chief engine builder for Dale Earnhardt for many years, is now the chief engine builder for this team. And everybody thought that was going to be the ingredient that they needed to really make them go well. But as you say, it hasn't worked out that well. Number 26, number 5, and number 94 running nose to tail on the racetrack. And that's Rick Mast in the Banquet Food Chevrolet right in front of them. The last race for the Banquet Food sponsorship on that car, and they're still looking for a sponsor. Is that not right, Ned? Yes, they are still looking for a sponsor for that car. They'd like to win all the races, try to win the Rick of the Year, but uh, it might be tough for them if they don't find sponsorship. The 26 car, by the way, is running in seventh position, so this is seventh, eighth, and ninth. Here comes Mark Martin in car number six. The number 27 car of Rusty Wallace at the moment. This is third and fourth position as first and second have about a half a straightaway advantage on these two guys. Rusty Wallace, we see the, the results, the consequences of him not pitting on that first time by. Back in fourth spot right now, and he got by here again. He was fifth, he got by again, but he's going to have a little bit more trouble getting by Mark Martin, it looks like. Martin, of course, was the pole setter and was very fast, as we mentioned earlier in practice here yesterday afternoon, but he might be driving a little bit conservative here today. He hasn't really tried to run that hard. He led for in the early part of the race, but now he uh, seems to be just sitting there riding. Rusty Wallace ended the 1988 season on a roll, and he has won two of the fourth races in 1989. Over the last six months, have you really been lucky, or have you been on this roll? Well, the car's running great. You know, I, I feel excited. I feel like I'm aggressive out there. Even though the car's handling well, you can still, when you, whenever you tie aggressively into a well-handling car, that makes for a fast track. And, the, uh, you know, I've won some races this year in a pretty dominant fashion, and some I haven't. But, uh, you know, if I can keep this fire burning just like I had burning last year, that's what it's all about. I want that $1 million that, you, that, that R.J. Art puts up. And, uh, you know, but most of all, I want the Winston Cup title. That's what it's all about. And I want to try to win the thing and pick up where I left off last year. And I think we also have to mention again that despite the fact that he has won half of the races this year, he is sixth in the point standings behind Bodine, Marlon, Waltrip, Kowicki, and Earnhardt. So winning is not necessarily uh, going to win you the Winston Cup. 
Now, Bill Elliott, 1985, can testify to that when he won 11 races. Yet, uh, Darrell Walter came out the winner of the championship, winning, I think, six races. And Rusty has moved into third spot, as you saw him able to pass Mark Martin and the interval between third place and first and second right here. They're not separated by very much. Earnhardt, then Kowicki, and here comes Rusty Wallace. Wallace might be gaining a little bit on him. Uh, I think I mentioned Mark Martin might be running uh, a little bit conservative right now. I believe that that is his game plan at this point of the race. He knows this is a very tough racetrack, a tough race to run 500 miles, and he wants to try to have a car that be there at the end of the race. You wonder if Kowicki maybe is doing the same thing. He moved up on Earnhardt there a little bit earlier, but then uh, sort of settled back, gave enough room there, about 10 or 12 car lengths behind him, giving himself plenty of room to maneuver. Let's go to Jack Root for more on that story. Well, Ned, you're absolutely right. Steve Neal and Mark Martin sat down before this race and said, look, we know we're quick. Everybody knows that we're quick. But let's just determine a pace based on the stopwatch on what the car feels comfortable at. And until the late going, let's just try and keep it there. I checked with Steve about 10 laps ago, and he said, that's exactly what we're doing. We're not really racing anybody but the lady in black. The racetrack is a very has a very bad reputation, but today it's been a very safe race and a very conservative one that we have seen in the first 111 laps. Dale Earnhardt on the roll as Darrell Waltrip, the winner of the Daytona 500, was involved in a crash earlier with Phil Parsons, and he's on the sidelines with his wife Stevie watching this Trans South 500. We'll be back with more live coverage after this on ESPN Speed World. flag comes out on Darlington as Rusty Wallace is in trouble. The third place competitor Rusty Wallace is low on the racetrack and headed for the pits. Quite a surprise here. He was running so well having taken over third place just a few laps ago from Mark Martin. But something is wrong. You can see a tire shredding. It's coming apart. Yeah, evidently he had a had a tire to blister or either maybe go flat or both. The right heads down to pit road. Let's go to Jack Root, who's there. Well, Rusty Wallace brings the car limping onto pit road, and it's a left front tire that is down, just riding on the inner liner, and they're going to have a great deal of difficulty this time getting the jack up underneath the car. Now, you may wonder, how can they get through inspection with these cars? Well, the car went through the inspection with the Goodyears on. It's not that it's that low in terms of what NASCAR allows, but the leader starts to come onto pit road as Wallace and company have to go to work because he's got a flat tire on the right side as well. Let's go back up to you as they continue the work here on Rusty Wallace's car. And Jack, they're going to Goodyear tires now. They had Hoosier tires on it, but they're changing back to the Goodyear and everybody else in pit on pit road now. And here's our crew camp as David Smith jacks up the Goodrich Chevrolet of Dale Earnhardt. Man, what great shots those are. <laughs> Boy, it didn't take long, did it? Man, oh man. Rusty Wallace lost a lap. And not only was the left front flat, but that right rear was completely torn apart. I wonder if he spun over there somewhere and we didn't see it. He did. Okay. He did spin, I'm sure. Well, here's yeah. a replay. See, he's already sideways on the track, and there goes the tire. There it is, right there. <laughs> that was the tire that blew. Folks, what happens when you hit the brakes and the car slides across the pavement, the abrasiveness of the asphalt just rubs the rubber right off the tire and right to the air, and boom, the tire blows out. Well, Rusty Wallace has been in this position many, many times before. He, in fact, is used to this, coming from a lap or more down and still being able to win the race. He's a lap down now at Darlington. Our neighbor, Oren. Ever since he got his new Murray, he's been mowing the whole neighborhood. Uh -huh. When you pay good money for a mower, you want it to be tough and dependable. Does such a good job, we're making the yard bigger. Uh -huh. What? Does such a Murray good... mowers are as tough as they come, cutting after cutting after cutting. That Murray's a good buy. What? Goodbye. Oh, say hello to Edna. Murray mowers, tough as they come. The caution is still out as Rusty Wallace had a problem over on the backstretch and did a spin down in turn number three. He has lost a lap, but 
That's nothing that uh, is necessarily going to harm him very much. Now, let's go down to Jack Rudis with Barry Dotson, and perhaps we can get the answer to the question, did he run over something? Did the tire, tar, tire go flat, or did he just spin? Jack? Well, you look here, and here's Raymond Beadle. He's the owner of the car, and Barry Dotson is talking directly to Rusty Wallace right now. As soon as he gets done there, we'll ask him, Barry, we understand that Rusty radioed in that he ran over something on the backstretch. Evidently said he ran over something and cut it. It was all of a sudden and uh, no vibration, and, uh, no warning whatsoever. Put the Goodyear's on because we're going to be a lap down and they're quicker. So we got a better chance of getting it back for them probably. But they're only quicker for a while. And what if this thing goes for some green flag action here? You'll be right back to where you were before. Well, we're, we're where the competition is. So I guess that's the way we got to look at it. <laughs> Here's a gambler, gentlemen. Indeed, just another uh, decision that you got to make on pit road, and whether it pans out, well, we'll know in a while. But for right now, Rusty Wallace is a lap down and will restart in 18th spot. I tell you, that was some very good, quick thinking down there on their part. That they didn't know for sure if they were going to go a lap down, but when they came in, they went ahead, put those Goodyear on there, knowing that they were faster, give him a better chance to get his lap back. So those guys are thinking and thinking so quickly. Yeah. No one, you know that the thing that we saw a moment ago or just a little bit ago from Ontario, California, Barry Dawson was my jack man back then. That's right. So he's been around this business a long time as the green wave and Greg Sachs the leader. Five bonus points for Greg Sachs as he leads on the restart. But look at Rusty Wallace go to the inside and motor ahead. Here comes Dale Earnhardt also passing Greg Sachs. But now Rusty is legally on the lead lap and Rusty would like nothing better than to see a piece of debris suddenly appear on the racetrack and another caution to come out because then he can encircle the entire track and get right back in the thick of things. You can bet your bottom dollar even though they're friends that Dale Earnhardt will do his best to try to get Rusty Wallace to put him on that map. Friendship is one thing outside the race car, but when you're in there, well, <laughs> it's a bit, bit of a different story, especially when you're shooting for an ultimate goal of $1 million in the Winston Cup Championship. That's one million friends, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Here's Alan Kowicki in car number seven running behind the 88 car of Greg Sachs and ahead of the number eight car of Bobby Hillen Jr. Greg Sachs, this is the best run that he's had all year as we see Kowicki trying to go by. Even though if Kowicki does get by, it's the best run that Greg Sachs has had this year so far. He's another driver that likes this racetrack, Benny. He came here in the Dingman Brothers cars a couple of years ago and, and ran in the top 10, top 5 for a while and until he had some sort of a mechanical problem. But he just likes this racetrack. He got outside there, though, now, and everybody going by. And there goes Harry Gant, also passing Sachs. Gant, the number 33 car, has not had a top 5 finish since Rockingham in October of 1986. And here's Mark Martin, also going to the inside of Greg Sachs at the end of the straightaway. Mark Martin moves up another position. Let's go to uh, Jerry Punch in the pit area who can bring us up to date on what's going on with Mark Martin. Well, gentlemen, Steve Bill, Robert Pemberton, and the Mark Martin, Jack Roush crew decided to go ahead and go back to the good years now. After seeing what happened to Rusty Wallace over there, they weren't sure whether Rusty ran over something or whether the car just came apart or what. Rick Bass taps the wall over in turn three. Gets the Darlington stripe. He's still running, but very high on the racetrack. That bank with Chevrolet now really high, trying to avoid traffic coming out of turn four. Rick Bass having this trouble. But anyway, Mark Martin's crew has gone back to the good years, as have the Rusty Wallace crew. A lot of crews now taking a long, hard look at possibly staying on the good years as absolutely long as possible. Well, there's quite a bit of damage here on the right side of Rick Mass car that has Banquet Frozen Food sponsorship for this race. And Rusty would like nothing more to have seen a yellow come out because of that. But because Rick did not stop on the racetrack, simply continued on, we're going to have no caution. And I believe... Oh, oh Earnhardt! Dale Earnhardt's in the wall! Earnhardt slams the wall going into turn number one. So this will definitely bring out the caution, or we assume so, although Dale is also still running, albeit very slowly down the back stretch, and smoke coming from the right, right side of the car. I believe he must have had a tire go down as he went into that turn because he shot into that wall too quick. He could have gotten in there too hard, but here's Wallace charging on down. No yellow flag. So Rusty loses out on the second opportunity here in the last two laps. 
to get wow. back uh, up in a competitive situation. But nevertheless, he is just motoring away from everybody. Yeah, he, he was not too far ahead of Dale Earnhardt, but now as he looks in his rear view mirror, those other cars who Alan Kowicki now is the leader, they're far behind him, so he's not in danger of going a lap down. So he can run out there pretty comfortably for a while now. Earnhardt's having all kinds of problems getting back to his pit. He yeah, still he is. is not back to his pit. A very slow movement toward pit road for Dale Earnhardt. Here he comes. Moving very slowly. I tell you, there's some heavy damage that automobile did. He hit yes, the wall hard. Yes, he did. And it just shot into the wall all of a sudden. I, I believe that he must have run over something and cut that right front tire. I believe it is flat as we see it come around. Well, he goes one lap down and now stands to go more than that. In fact, he's pulling behind the wall. Dale Earnhardt suffers a serious misfortune here as that car slammed the wall pretty good up in turn number one. You can see that the body has been bent back on that tire and Dale, instead of stopping on pit road, goes behind the wall. Well, the man who had been the model of consistency this year with three third place finishes, one second place finisher, and of course the leader in the Winston Cup point standings coming into this race could lose that lead here today. Because Alan Kowicki is in second position in the points and he's a leader of the race. And now we're watching some great competition between the number eight car of Bobby Hillen Jr. and the 33 of Harry Gant as they contest third place, I believe. That's second right place. Now, second place. That's Kowicki second. is running in second place. Harry Gant is running in the third position. And fourth is Mark Martin. And Jerry Punch is with Dale Earnhardt. Well, Dale is behind the wall, still sitting in the car. Dale, first of all, what happened up there, Dale? He's sitting back, he had a flat tire. Now, let me tell you, fans, he is holding his left knee. Hmm. His left knee took quite a bit of a bang against that steering column when he hit the wall. Are you okay, Dale? He nods, but uh, he's got both hands out on that left knee, holding it where he banged the steering column. They're gonna try to get the car repaired and get him back out. He's leading these Winston Cup points, and he wants to try to run as many laps as possible. As we watch the crew cam, David Smith and the crew under the car trying to get some of the damage beat away. Well, he took his headset off and just put it down on the ground. That's how we're getting there, uh, the pictures from that. But you can tell that Dale Earnhardt is in pain. You can tell by the grimace on his face that although he would like to perhaps slough it off, he is in a great deal of pain as he sits there and waits for the car to be repaired. The problem is he knows there we see the race for second place, but he knows they're going to fix their car. Dale Earnhardt's going to have to go back on the racetrack, and he don't feel like going back on the racetrack. Folks, when you hit there, Alan Kowicki, the first car we saw as a leader, Bobby Hill at number eight, the gold number eight, and Harry Gant, the 33, that's second and third. But let me tell you, Bob Jenkins, when you go in the corner at that speed and blow a tire and go up and smack the wall like Earnhardt did, it knocks all the air out of your body. I'm and, sure it does. And your legs go flying around. He hit his knee on the steering column, as Jerry Punch said. He is in pain. I've been there. I know he's in pain. Good race for second place here, Bobby Hillen and Harry Gant now trying to move them down on the inside of him as they go into turn three. Can he make the pass this time? Gant just drives yes. her on down in there. Nice move by Harry Gant, who now moves into second position behind Alan Kowicki. Bobby Hillen Jr. is third, fourth is Mark Martin. Now let's go down to Jackaroot. We talked earlier about the uh, who those tires that Daryl Waltrip uh, had are going to go to. Jack, what's the answer to the question? Well, do you see this yellow pad here, Bob? This has got all the setups that Daryl Waltrip had for each set of tires. Thus far, as Benny Parsons alluded to, Rick Hendrick has made the call, and the Folgers team, with Ken Schrader aboard, has taken two sets, and four sets of these tires are now going to Jeff Bodine's pit. The reason for that, as you know, is Bodine is backing up badly on the racetrack. And we checked with Waddell Wilson, and he said, I don't think we've got the right set of tires here on pit road to correct the handling problems with the car. So he's going to his teammate, Daryl Walter, who's out of the race, and hopefully one of these sets here will work for Schrader and more importantly for Bodine. Back to you. All right, Ken Schrader unofficially back in 15th position, and at the moment, the number five car is in 10th spot. Alan Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin, leads the Trans South 500 with 132 out of 367 laps completed. We'll take another break and be back with more of this Winston Cup race.
HBO and Cinemax in April. The best movies. That's got this hot in Brooklyn. They're six foot two with the brain of an 11 year old. NASCAR Winston Cup Racing today from Darlington, South Carolina and the Trans South 500. Alan Kowicki in the Xerox Ford car number seven is the leader of the race while work continues on Dale Earnhardt's car. He crashed just a few laps ago. It did not bring out a caution, but it certainly did do some damage to the car and to Dale. He was leading the race going into turn one, and all of a sudden you see the car just veer up to the wall. He apparently cut a tire, hit the wall, and it took a long time to get back. He is in the pits where the work's going on, and Dr. Jerry Punch is there. Well, they're still working on the car number three, and the, the damage is a lot more serious than what they'd originally anticipated. Apparently, they not only have chassis suspension problem, but they've also broken the fuel pump in the right side of the car. When he slammed the wall, he's broken the fuel pump. They've got to change that now. Let me show you what caused the problem. Here's the right front tire off the Goodrich Chevrolet. And this big, long slice here, he ran over something on the racetrack going into turn one. He cut the tire and slammed the wall. So this tiny little inch and a half slice is what caused all this damage to the championship race car. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Well, you can see the huddle that's going on right here between Paul Andrews, the crew chief, and one of his team members. What he's doing is dispatching guys as guys drive out of the racetrack and begging for tires. You really need some rubber bad, don't you? Well, I wouldn't say I was begging, but yeah, we need some rubber real bad. <laughs> that's about the only way we can put it. We did Goodyear ran out of tires this morning. We needed, we were going to mount them some more, and they were out, so I don't know what we can do yet. Now, Paul, you've got some Hoosiers mounted here, but you've elected to stay Goodyear all the way. Well, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to stay with Goodyear, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. It just depends on how the rest of the race goes and how many cars fall out. If some cars fall out, you know, we've got some cars committed that they're going to give us their tires, but yet everyone's running, so we can't get any yet. Who are the cars that are committed to you to give you some tires? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly because i got I got two tire runners that go get the stuff, and I don't even want to be concerned about it. <laughs> it may be an Olympic. It may be an Olympic sport, Benny Parsons, next time when we go out to do the Olympics. Tire running, because he's got three, actually two guys, and he's going to dispatch a third now to look for some tires. Man, that's unbelievable. Uh, 2,000 tires, Goodyear brought, and they're out of rubber. But we saw that slice just a moment ago in Dale Earnhardt's car, and I guess we all criticized NASCAR. Oh, we all criticized NASCAR late in the race. We watched Kowicki behind Chad Little, got boxed in, Harry Gantz right behind him. But we criticize NASCAR for throwing a caution flag for debris. But you see, folks, what debris does? A little piece of metal caused that damage on Earnhardt's car. He's out of the race. His chance of winning is gone today. Could have even cost him the Western Cup championship. You don't know until the end of the year. Harry Gant is very, very impressive. The car sliding high there in turn number one in his pursuit of Alan Kowicki, our leader. But this is a very fine run for Mr. Gant, who has twice won on this racetrack in 1983 at the Trans South 500 and in 1984 at the Southern 500. But it's been a long time since he was in victory lane for Winston Cup event. Bobby Hillen Jr., meanwhile, is also very impressive in his run this afternoon. As we continue to watch this, because it appears as if Harry might be thinking about taking over the lead from Alan Kowicki. Look at the car slide wow. out there in turn one. Oof. Now, he don't mind getting it up close to the wall. Harry Gant will drive her up there. He, he, uh, if the car's working well, which it apparently is right now. Well, Harry Gant will run higher than anybody on the racetrack, with maybe the exception of Dale Earnhardt. But right now, Ern Harry Gant is more of a seasoned veteran here down He's had more miles, more laps at Darlington. He's going to work this traffic, work this racetrack a little better than Kowicki, even though Kowicki's been here three or four years for Darlington. That might not be enough experience. Looks as if Gant is able to close in tighter in the corners, and then Allen uh, has a drive away down the straightaway. Well, particularly in three and four. Now, in turns one and two, Gant loses a little bit there. So that means that uh, his car is a little bit loose down there, but it works better up through turns three and four. Now, you can see he's picking back up on him as he goes through that turn. In the last few laps, he's been right on his bumper as he come off the of turn four. He's moving in there again. But then when they go into turn one, his car just goes a little bit higher down there in that turn. Harry Gant led 79 laps at Rockingham in the time he has led so far this season. Now here is the number six car driven by Mark Martin in third and the fourth place car of Davey Allison. Mark Martin, of course, was a pole sitter for this race, led the first few laps, but now finds himself in third position, and there's Davey Allison fourth. You know, Mark Martin is... 
he ought to be happy with third because he hasn't had a very good year. But as well as that car was running in practice, he's disappointed right now. He feels like he should be driving away from the field. And, you know, he has a chance to pick up over $22,000 in extra money that only he can win today. From Unical, the 76 Challenge, only the pole winner can win the money. If he doesn't win it, it goes on to the next race at Bristol. Benny, I, uh, I still believe that he's sort of cooling it right now. I, I believe he's sort of happy running in third place. I, I know you'd like to be out front picking up uh, when there is lap money and all that kind of thing. Of course, we'll have a halfway challenge coming up here before too long, $10,000. Then then we'll know who really wants to lead the race. But uh, I believe he's pretty content the way he's running right now, saving that car towards the end so that he can pick up that big bonus. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Davey Allison, Allison on the inside. Yeah, he's challenging him and taking away the position, so Davey Allison moves to third spot. Looked to me like Martin got a little bit loose coming off that second corner, and when he when he got a little bit loose, he had to come out of the throttle to control it. When he did, Davey Allison had the momentum. Right by him, he went. Mark didn't find him too much there. He said, okay, <laughs> you, you, you got the move. Uh, you know, you got the line. Go ahead and take it. And we see Bobby Hill right behind that duo in that gold car. He's running very well. Well, Jerry Punch in the pit area has a comment on this run by Mark Martin, the Stroll Life Board. Well, Ned, as you and Benny were talking about Mark Martin maybe cooling it a little bit uh, early in this race, that's exactly what he's doing. While you were talking, I was there talking to Steve Meal, the crew chief, and apparently they were set up to start out on Goodyear's and then switch to the Hoosiers and run the Hoosiers during the middle portion of the race and save their Goodyear tires, their four or five sets of all they have to the last part of the race when they would need the speed. Well, they, that strategy went out the window when they saw Rusty Wallace's part tire come apart and spin. But now they are back on Goodyear, but they aren't really set up to run the Goodyear as early as they wanted to. And the car isn't that quick, so they said, well, just be patient, keep the car on the wall, stay out of trouble, and we'll let the last part of the race take care of itself. We're going to be out of tires. We know that. Maybe we can buy some or borrow or steal or something from somebody. But uh, you're right. He is cooling his jets right now, just taking it easy here early on at Darlington. But Bobby Hillen Jr., I think, on the other hand, is doing all he can to get up into a competitive situation. Bobby Hillen Jr. with a very impressive run, certainly his best of the 1989 season. He started the race in 15th position. By lap number 50, he had dropped down to 17th. But then, by lap number 100, he had moved up to 11th. And then, that 50-lap period between 100 and 150, he really made some progress, moving all the way up to his current position of fifth. Bobby Hillen Jr. from Midland, Texas, in the Miller High Life Carnival the leader, meanwhile, is in traffic. Alan Kowicki in the Xerox Ford Car 7 is the leader. He has uh, the number two car of Ernie Irvin now ahead of him as he's able to pass the number 70 car. And now Ernie Irvin moves low on the track and allows the leader, Alan Kowicki, to pass by. Well, the tree climbing dog, the very famous now flat nose that we introduced to you uh, a couple of years ago here at Darlington. He lives just down the racetrack and he is here in all of his glory enjoying this Trans South 500. This is Bob Jenkins in Darlington, South Carolina, but at 4.30 Eastern Time this afternoon live, Lendl versus, what is that, LASIK? There you go. With exciting tennis from Florida, that's coming up next at 4.30 live here on ESPN, right after our Trans-South 500 here at Darlington. We're inside Morgan Shepard's car, as he has just made a pit stop. Morgan was in for a four-tire change in the Valvoline Pontiac number 75. Might see other cars coming in before too long, but here's the leader of the race, Alan Kowicki, car number seven. And there is Harry Gant, not too far behind. In fact, within a few car lengths. Gant had pulled right up on his back bumper there for a little bit, and then Kowicki was able to pull away as they came through some traffic, so he's maintained uh, a reasonable lead over it. You can see the difference there, about a second. Tell you something, folks. As we see Harry again in the Skull Bandit going around the racetrack, Rusty Wallace blew the tire, spun out, and he is in front of Alan Kowicki trying to get his lap back. If the caution should come out, he would. But let me tell you that Alan Kowicki is gaining on Rusty Wallace. He's closed up a half a second in the last three laps. Jerry Punch now has positioned himself in the Harry Gant pit with a comment on this really fine run by the Taylorsville, North Carolina driver. 
Indeed it is, Bob. You know, and it shouldn't be surprising at all. Harry Gant, uh, last time in this race car, we saw him at Rockingham here on ESPN, and he led 79 laps, only to be involved in that melee up there between Rudd, Earnhardt, and Harry Gant. So, of course, it, that car was uh, damaged heavily. He ended up finishing 31st, but this car runs well on mile or mile and a half tracks, and Gant said we expect a good run here at Darlington. He likes this racetrack. It's a driver's track, and Leo Jackson and the rest of the Skull crew were very happy with this Banjo Matthews prepared car the way it was running here. So Harry Gant running awfully well. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Well, Jerry Punch, as you know, normally under race conditions, a crew chief and a team manager has more than his hands full. But Robert Yates, who covers the action for Davey Ellison, is being outfitted with our crew cam. So he's going to fill in now that Dale Earnhardt has dropped out. And not only that, Robert, while they're trying to work on you, you've got to be concerned about tire wear in the run by Davey. Are you okay tire-wise? I didn't really understand what you said, but... Are right tire-wise? Uh... We got about 30 laps on fuel to go. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to run the full 30 laps when we have to have right size. Now, we checked with his tire man, and he's got a left set from the Hardy's car when Dale Jarrett dropped out, that they feel that they're all right. As you take a look at the crew cam there, they've about completed the operation. He's going to be giving us some great pictures, but as we said, they feel they've got enough tires to go the distance now, both Goodyear and Hoosier, because they rated those from Dale Jarrett when he dropped out of the race. Boy, the picture from that little bitty camera is just incredible, isn't it? As Robert Yates now has it on with Davey Allison's uh, crew. And you notice our ESPN camera men now are wearing the fire suits uh, in the pits. And another great safety factor. And there is the leader, Alan Kolwicki, with now 160 laps completed. hit the brakes and the car wanted to move around on the racetrack. But as you said earlier, he is gaining on Rusty Wallace. He has pulled away from Harry Gant, so he is the fastest car on the racetrack, even though it might look a little bit slippery in the turns. And certainly those tires, Benny, are getting worn now, and it'll make her slide over the turns. You can sort of roll pins and needles out there. Look at the car. Back in the pack. See that car wiggle just a little bit? Yeah. Oh, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Jenkins. That's all right. Back in the pack, we have the number 88 car of Greg Sachs, the 42 machine driven by Kyle Petty, and the 5 of Jeff Bodine. And that is 7th, 8th, and ninth position. Now Kyle Petty moves into 7th spot, going to the low side and passing oh. the 88 car of Sachs. And now here comes Jeff Bodine. What happened when, Rick, when Kyle pulled up in front of Sachs? He took all the air off that rear spoiler. I knew that car was going to get loose when he came off the corner, and sure enough, it did. And Kyle's heart, it's, I think it started beating about right now. After a couple of disappointments for that team this year, the number 42 car of Kyle Petty, it is back and running well. And that number five car driven by Jeff Bodine, well, there has only been one driver that has led all events in the Winston Cup Series so far this year. That has been Jeff Bodine in the number five car. He has not led a lap yet here today. Rusty Wallace is really losing ground right now to Alan Kowicki. He had gotten himself back in the lead lap, hoping for a caution. That caution has not come, and now Kowicki is really mowing him down. Don't know how many more laps he can, can stay out there ahead of him, but Kowicki is only about a second and a half behind Rusty Wallace at this point. Now the number 11 car is about to go a lap down. Or another two lap laps, down. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Terry Labonte. But a very disappointing race last week in uh, Richmond when he had an incident and hit the wall. And things haven't been going well this weekend either for that fourth Thunderbird this year from the Junior Johnson stable. And he's coming into the pits right now as they uh, went around him on the back stretch. But you can see Rusty Wallace, the first car on the screen. Jimmy Means and the Alka Seltzer car between them. But then here comes Alan Kowicki. So he is definitely closing in. Labonte, as Ned mentioned, did come in for a pit stop and is there right now as they change tires on the right side and now the Budweiser Thunderbird moves back out onto the racetrack. This is one of the longest green flag runs we've had since the race started. I think we're going to see other cars coming into the pits here pretty quickly. Robert Yates, who owns the heavily star for Thunderbird that Davey Allison drives, mentioned there a moment ago that they didn't have enough tires to go a full gas stop that's going to have to come in for too long to change. And you can see that 
Alan Kowicki. I mean, yes, has moved in closer to Rusty Wallace. Now we see some great racing back in the pack. The, the 88 car is just dropping back. We saw him leading the race just a moment ago, and it looks like his tires are gone because the 30 cars, so many cars, Michael Walton just passed him. Ricky Rush pulled up behind him. The 88 car have got some serious problems right now. Well, Benny, these drivers are really having a tough time when they go into these turns. You mentioned Alan Kowicki doing a little bit of slipping and sliding, and he's still the fastest car on the racetrack. You can imagine what some of those other fellows back in the field are going through if their cars are not handling quite as well and those tires worn as much as they are now. When they get in those turns, they, they, it's like almost riding as if you were on ice out there. It sure is. And running this close together, and certainly the speeds they run here, there's quite a bit of air that comes up uh, from the other cars, upsets the car, as you mentioned earlier, on the spoiler situation. And here now, Alan Kowicki has caught Rusty Wallace, trying to put him a lap down. He moves down on the inside, takes measure of him, had to come off a of turn two, and he'll run side to side down the back stretch. Rusty will try to beat him into that turn. Let's see who backs off first, and it's Rusty. He just had, didn't have much choice, but I tell you what, Ned, would you have, if someone had told you January in the, of 1989 that Alan Kowicki would be the most dominant car in the first five races of the Winston Cup season, you'd never believe him, would you? Well, no, I knew Alan would run strong, filthy would, because he ran strong last year, particularly in the last half of the season, but I would not have thought that he would dominate as much as he has up to this point. Well, certainly Alan Kowicki has been very, very good in the first five races of this year. Now putting a lap down, uh, Rusty Wallace, a lap down. We well, they, those cars are about to come into the pits. In fact, there's action out on Wallace's pit road, and sure enough, here he comes. So Rusty Wallace brings the Kodiak Pontiac down pit road, and Jackie Arute will be there to call the action. Well, Ned, the crew has decided that after he went back down the lap that they'll come in and take four tires all the way around. They're going to stick with the good years, but they said no sense to try and stay out there because the tires have just gone away. So he has had, got his lap back. Now he's lost it again. Barry Dotson brings the jack around to complete the exchange of tires all the way around. And very seldom, as you know, do you see a four-tire change under green, but not today. They've got to do it each and every time. He is off the way in 21.6 seconds. A good stop for four tires under green. That is an excellent stop for four wow. tires under green. But the world's record, I mean, folks in Rockingham, each year they have a, a competition and the world's record is 23 and a half seconds or something yeah. for a four tire stop. I mean, I realize that the timing isn't quite the same, but nevertheless, that's world record speed right there. Excellent, excellent stop for Rusty Wallace and Barry Dotson and the rest of the Kodiak pit crew. Alan Kowicki is staying out on the racetrack. The number 10 car of Ken Bouchard moving to the inside as Alan sets the pace with 171 laps in the book. We'll be back with more of the Trans South 500 after these messages. Stay with us. Action continues. Robbie Knievel will attempt to jump over the Caesars Fountain Caesars Palace Fountains on a live pay-per-view spectacular Friday, April 14th at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Now, you should contact your local, local cable system to subscribe to this live pay-per-view spectacular. Will he make it over the fountains? Robbie Knievel will attempt on Friday, April the 14th. Rusty Wallace driving like someone possessed right now. He just drove by Harry Gant, the second place car. The green and white 33, that's the 11. The red and white 33, Terry Lobani that he went by. On lap number 184 in 10 more laps, $10,000 will go to the leader of the race in the Gillette right guard halfway challenge. $10,000 to the leader of the race at the halfway point. Let's go down to Jerry Punch in the pit area. Well, Neil bought it behind the wall in the Sitco Ford, and Neil, it's been a tough day for you. What happened? Well, we, you know, we were off the pace, and coming off four, the motor just let off. You know, it started falling down. I lifted it out of the throttle. It seemed like we're on seven cylinders. They're just trying to see if we can get back in or not. Leonard Wood and the rest of the Wood Brothers trying to work on the car. You mentioned about the halfway challenge, fellas. Interesting, Harry Gant pitted on lap 115. He would have to run 69 laps 
to make it to halfway. They think they can make it to halfway and try to pick up $10,000. They don't believe that Kowicki can go to halfway point. I think Kowicki will have to pit sometime in the next five to seven laps, and that will give, again, $10,000 from Gillette right guard by default. That's what the Harrogate crew is hoping will happen in about six or seven laps. Well, it appears, Jerry, as if that is going to be the situation because the Xerox team is ready for a pit stop. You can see that the tire men are holding the tires, getting ready to jump over that wall. Alan Kowicki is on lap number 177, and the halfway point is 184, and I don't know whether he's going to stretch it or not, but boy, to give up $10,000 would uh, be unfortunate for Alan. Well, it really would because he has a good lead, well, a pretty good lead. There's Harry Gant coming into the picture back behind him there. We saw that orange car uh, remind us that Darrell Walter pulled back out on the trap a few few laps ago. But uh, we understand that Kowicki may be coming in this coming uh, lap, this next time around. So he will give up the lead just before the halfway point. But he perhaps is thinking more about winning the race than winning the $10,000 being the leader at the halfway point. Indeed, the number seven car. Oh, and he has overshot the pit entrance almost and had to really slam on the brakes and slide sideways. Here comes Alan Kowicki for the pit stop. Jack Aroot will be there to call the action as the Xerox Ford is headed your way. Well, he gathers his emotions back in and tries to hit the mark as he comes to the service of Paul Andrews and company. The Xerox Ford has come in, and I asked Paul before they came in, what about the 10 grand? He said, we thought about it, we talked about it, but we couldn't make it. The tires have just gone away, so he's elected to come in and forsake the 10 grand for hopefully a trip to Victory Lane. They've completed the exchange of rubber on the right side, and now they, now they are going to the left side as well. Something is hanging down from the front of Kowicki's car, however. It's a little bit of the of the fiberglass is actually hanging down in the front part of Kowicki's car at 24.4 seconds, the four-tire stop. Well, that was a very good stop, Jack, no question about it. But when you compare it with the 21.2 that Rusty Wallace made, well, it looks a little bit slow. Here's Mark Martin in for a pit stop in the Stro Lights Ford number six. Steve Beal led crew going to work on that car as they're completing the tire change on the right side. Fuel is going in the car. Looks like they're uh, not going to change left no, side rubber. They're only changing the right side, so he's down the way in 18 and 110 seconds. And 180 laps are now complete. We are four away from the Gillette right guard halfway challenge, and the leader is Harry Gant. Is he going to stay out there and uh, use those worn tires and pick up the $10,000, or will he too have to come in? He has Ricky Rudd in the number 26 car and Richard Petty in the 43 just ahead of him. Now, Ricky Rudd just made a pit stop not long, not too long ago. He was pitting on the back stretch. He should be able to pull away from Kent. Richard Petty out Bill. in front there, and here's Bill Elliott in the pits. Right side tire change on the number nine Ford. Bill needed a good race, as we indicated in the open, to get back up there in terms of Winston Cup points to defend his championship, but it's just not happening for the Dawsonville driver again. And here's Jeff Bodine in. And we noticed that they're putting Goodyear tires on Bill Elliott's car. He had switched to Hoosier at one time, but they definitely put Goodyear back on it this time. Let's go to Jack Aroot once again, quickly. Now, Jeff Bodine is going to Hoosier tires, taking off the Goodyears and going to the Hoosiers. They've changed the right, rim, the right side, and they're going around to the left side tires now, completing the fuel fill. Now, you'll notice that they're filling fuel a little differently this year, and what's happened is now they will only take one tank at a time over the wall. His service is off and away, and Bodine is back. Sterling Marlin moving out of the pits just ahead of Jeff Bodine with the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet making its way back onto the racetrack. Next time around, we'll get the $10,000 bonus to the leader of the race, and it appears as if it's going to be Harry Gant. There he is in the skull band at car number 33. He's off the second corner and down the back stretch and is within one half lap of $10,000. Apparently, Harry Gant is going to win the money and then come right in, which is not bad strategy at all. Let's see if he officially does it. I think there's going to be little doubt off of corner number four. And here is the halfway mark. The cross flags by Harold Kinder signal the one halfway mark. And Harry Gant has picked up $10,000 in the Gillette right guard halfway challenge. 
not only $10,000 to the driver, but also a fan stands to, pin, uh, stands to pick up $10,000 by simply filling out a coupon at a uh, local store. Now, here is the 28 car of Davey Allison. He has come in for a pit stop as the crew works on the right side and refuels that car. Davey had moved up into second position, having a very good run here today. I'm sure that Bobby Allison, his dad, here in town, Alabama, watching today and proud of his son's run. He just changed his right side tires, gets back on the go, and here is Harry Gant in the pits, and Jerry punches there. Harry Gant brings the Skull Oldsmobile to a halt, and Andy Petrie and Charlie Presley and the rest of the crew go to work to clean the windshield. It will be a four-tire change. Already had the right side tires on. Here comes Charlie Presley around carrying the jack. The left front tire now coming off the car. The jack goes up. Second can of fuel going in. It's been 90 races that Harry Gant has been in victory lane. Almost three years, making four years. Gant down and away in 23 seconds. Pretty good pit stop for the Leo Jackson crew. Well, it's being shown on the screen in 22 seconds, Jerry. was a very, very good pit stop. Almost equal that of Rusty Wallace, who did it in a over 21 seconds. And the number 83 car, driven by Lake Speed, has not pitted, and so he is the official leader of the race at the moment. And there is Lake, the winner of the Trans-South 500 one year ago. Now, as the Harry Gant gets his speed up going into turn three, he's not too far from the picture that we're seeing, but he was trying to race Alan Kowicki back into that turn as the leader comes across the start-finish line. Harry Gant and Alan Kowicki are coming off of turn four. Kowicki is just in front of Harry Gant, so they came out very close together. So Lake Speed on horn tires has the lead. You can see he's being passed. Number 15 car of Brett Bodine goes underneath and obviously at Lake Speed is going to have to make a pit stop before too long. As a matter of fact, he is doing it right now. So Lake Speed relinquishes the lead and it now goes back to Alan Kowicki with second place Harry Gann. Here comes Lake Speed. The bullseye barbecue car as he is pitted way up toward the fourth turn area. Robert Harrington, the crew chief on this car now. Let's see, they're, they're going to change all four tires too. We saw someone taking the bugs off the left side tire. Harry Gant now. He has the passed. number three has passed uh, Al Kowicki, did he? Yes, he has passed Kowicki and is driving away. I don't know if that means that just the new tires are that much better, but, uh, or if Kowicki's got a problem. Here we see Kowicki leading the race. Harry Gant comes off the corner and just drives by. Well, very now, impressive. He stopped about, Alan Kowicki stopped about eight or nine laps before Harry Gant did, and uh, those tires slow down pretty quick, and it might be that just the newness of his tires helped him to do that. Remember, once again, Kowicki has apparently set his car up like he did last week in Richmond to long run the long green period, so as time goes on, that car may be faster or at least stay at the same speed. We'll be right back. The Trans South 500 in Darlington, South Carolina. I'm Bob Jenkins along with Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Arood, and Dr. Jerry Punch. We're more than halfway through this race, and the lead is being held by the 33 car driven by Harry Gant. Running in second spot is Alan Kowicki. In third is Davey Allison. Fourth, Bobby Hillen Jr. And Mark Martin runs in sixth position, although we understand that the number six car may be having some problems and could be visiting Pitt Road before long. There is Mark, the pole center of this race, back to fifth at the moment, and the car certainly not uh, performing the way he had hoped it would. Jack Arood, I got a question. That, that last series of pit stops we saw several take on four tires but then again we saw some take only two why is that well to put it bluntly it was to try and make up time uh, mark martin decided his crew steve steve mail they decided to only go with right sides because they felt they could maybe just actually gamble it out on the left sides and say we've got to get a caution soon i just talked to stevens he said yeah the car's getting real loose but he said at darlington you can't go this long without a caution so they're gambling that a caution is going to come in the next 10 to 15 laps likewise with robert yates you saw the fast action there from the crew cam well they elected only to change right sides as well yates says hey you've got to get a caution soon so why take the gamble under green and change four so it may come up may come up roses for them but it may come up stones as well who knows one of the gambles that you got to make. And there is the uh, leader, Harry Gant, running right behind Dick Trickle. 
who again has been one of those in a substitute role for Mike Alexander who has been very very impressive. He finished in third position at Atlanta and was running among the leaders that time and there is Mark Martin. You can see the car just not up to full song as the 83 car of Lake Speed passed by. Yeah, I would, I would question rate really, of those that only took on uh, right side tires and didn't change all four while they were in the pits. It would have taken another 10 seconds to go ahead and change the left side tires, maybe even a little less than that. And uh, it sure would have made a difference in their speed on the racetrack. They can lose that much on the racetrack in about uh, 15 or 20 laps. And that's what Mark Martin's going to do if he isn't careful. And you say, well, he can stop and get two tires again, but folks, we've got to understand they're slowing down and taking off. And that takes a half a lap to be able to slow down, stop, and take off again is at least a half a lap. And here's Morgan Shepard bringing the Valvoline Pontiac into the pits, carrying one of our in-car cameras. There you can see Morgan getting a drink as the crew wipes off the windshield and refuels the car and puts new rubber on it. Mark Martin's crew is also ready for him to come in and get those left side tires perhaps. They're certainly out on pit road waiting for him to come in. There he is on the racetrack. Yep, he dips down now. He's coming down pit road. Mark Martin, the Batesville, Arkansas driver, who had great hopes going into this race of pulling off his first win in Winston Cup competition, but it doesn't appear it's going to happen. Jack Arood will call this pit stop. Well, Bob Jenkins, here's a case where you just hoped your way to make these tires last, and it didn't work for Steve Meal and Mark Martin. He, Martin just could not handle the car, and they talked on the radio, and he said, I've got to come in. They made the exchange, put in a lot faster, actually slower time than it would have been, as Jared said, to do it all four all the way around during the last green flag stop. A costly miscue by this team. Plus the fact, as many Parsons mentioned, the slowdown and the, and the getting back up to speed period, that is more critical, or at least as critical as the time that you lose in, on the pit road. Yeah, you know, when we have those uh, clocks up there in the upper right on pit stops and they show 22 seconds, that's great, but you also got to consider that time that it takes to slow down and to speed up once again. Harry Gann leads the race. And I'm sure a lot of fans are wondering what's happened to Rusty Wallace now after all of this round of pit stop. According to my calculations, I think Rusty's back in the lead lap. Now, he was one of the first ones to come in, so with those fresh tires on, he went up and passed Alan Kowicki, who was leading the race, as we see Dale Earnhardt coming back out onto the racetrack now. Here is Rusty Wallace. He's about uh, seven seconds in front of Harry Kent from being left, so he was able to pull away with those fresh tires on, but now Harry Kent has a little bit fresher tires than Rusty does, so Harry's picking up a little bit on it, so it just depends on how long they go on the green here. And Rusty's still running pretty good because Rusty Wallace is in fifth spot. As we see, Dale Earnhardt in the black three has made his repairs. He's back on the racetrack. And you got to wonder how well Dale is physically because when he hit the wall and came in for a pit stop, he was hurting and his knee was really uh, giving him problems. And again, he is just out there picking up those valuable Winston Cup points. It's going to be interesting because of Alan Kulwicki, who is in second position, uh, has a good race and finishes there. The uh, points lead could very well change. Jerry Punch, what have you been able to learn physically about Dale Earnhardt? Back by just a minute ago before he was to go back out on the racetrack and I talked to him, put my head in the car and talked to him for just a minute. And he said that uh, he just bumped the steering column with the left side of his knee and it caused a bad cramp on the upper part of his leg. The cramp went away, the knee's a little bit sore. He said, but hey, Doc, it'll take a lot more than that to get me out of this race car. I'm going to be all right. Now you can bet on that as Dale Earnhardt is one of, if not the fiercest competitor that Winston Cup has. And that's the reason why he is in the points lead right now. In the lead of the race, Harry Gant. There he is in the car number 33. After 203 laps of this 367 lap event. So we will take another break and resume our live coverage here at the track Too Tough to Tame in Darlington, South Carolina. We'll be right back. It's springtime and the dogwood is in bloom in South Carolina. At Darlington International Raceway, we're live for the Winston Cup Trans South 500. Today's Speed World coverage is being brought to you by Pontiac. We build excitement. By Zbart, car improvement specialists, makers of new super rust protection for the cars of the 90s. 
and by Budweiser, Beechwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This mug's for you. Harry Gant is leading the Trans South 500 from here at Darlington. And we mentioned a few minutes ago before the break that Rusty Wallace was back on the lead lap. Indeed, he is. As a matter of fact, he's all the way back up to fifth spot. So don't count Rusty out of this thing by any means. In second spot is Alan Kowicki. Third is Davey Allison. And fourth is Wallace. In sixth position is Sterling Marlin. Seventh is Jeff Bodine. Eighth is Ricky Rudd. Ninth is Kyle Petty. And those nine cars are on the lead lap. In tenth position, a lap down is uh, Michael Waltrip. Then comes Brett Bodine, Bill Elliott. The number four car driven by Rick Wilson. Then comes Mark Martin in 14th. Ken Schrader is 15th. Greg Sack 16th. And in 17th position is Lake Speed. 18th position, a couple of laps down, is the 84 of Dick Trickle. Then Richard Petty and Terry Labonte. It's good to see Harry Gant having such a wonderful day. The fellow that owns his car is Leo Jackson. And you remember the car that I used to drive, the black 55 Copenhagen car? That was Leo Jackson's automobile. So I drove for Leo for four years. A very nice man and a man who wants to race badly. And Bill's a good race car. And Bill's a very good race car. Andy Petrie, the crew chief on that automobile, also would be more a sometimes racer, I should say. Yep. Uh, runs up around Hickory some. Won some races last year at Hickory. At Hickory, Greenville Pickens Speedway in Greenville, South Carolina. Andy uh, is a pretty good driver. It's interesting that as Terry Labonte goes out of the pits, that uh, Dale Jarrett and Andy Petrie grew up, went to school together. As a matter of fact, Dale's Bush Grand National Team is called DAJ Racing, and it's not because it happens to be Dale Jarrett's initials, but there's another fellow by the name of Jimmy Newsom who went to school with them. They built their first race car together, took it to Hickory Speedway, and it was Dale, Andy, and Jimmy. That's how DAJ Racing was born, and so Andy Petrie now is a crew chief. Dale Jarrett, of course, a race driver. Jimmy Newsom, the other member of the family, he's in the tire business up in Newton, North Carolina, out of racing. Well, we mentioned at the very top of the program that we consider the tire situation to be the most important story of this race. And indeed, it has come into play several times during this event. Jerry Punch, kind of recap for us, if you will, the tire situation at this point. Well, I'd like to recap that, but you guys were just talking about Andy Petrie here and Leo Jackson. Andy Petrie, the crew chief on the car, and Leo Jackson, the car owner here that owns the Harry Gant car, standing to his right against the wall. The tall, bearded gentleman, absolutely an outstanding car owner and car builder. That is Leo Jackson you're looking at right now. We talk about a tire shortage. Well, Leo just told me a minute ago that they are concerned about not having enough Goodyear tires. And remember, after lap 293 here, within the last 100 miles of this race, you cannot change brands. So you're rolling the dice. If, if you're on Goodyear tires at lap 293, you better be sure you got enough Goodyear tires to go the distance. If you're running out of Goodyear tires, you may have to be switching to the Hoosier. A lot of teams are trying to calculate now just exactly what they can do. That's why a lot of teams wanted to run the Hoosier tires early and save all their sets of, of Goodyear, which are much quicker later on in the race. So they're trying to decide here in the Harry Gant pit what they're going to do. Will they be able to have enough Goodyears to go the way? They're going to have to try to risk it and stay on the Goodyears. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Well, Jerry, one team that has no tire shortage, Goodyears to be specific, is Rusty Wallace, who's running in fifth position. Take a look at this. One set, two set, three sets, four sets, five, six sets of brand new Goodyear tires. Now, let's take a look over here. He's got another one, two, three, four, five, six sets of Hoosiers. So whichever way it goes, Rusty Wallace is in A-OK -okay shape. And Rusty Wallace, as we mentioned, runs in fifth position. Now, Harry Gant in car number 33 there, the middle car, is uh, has already lapped the number seven car, of, uh, rather the number five car of Jeff Bodine. So that now means that there are seven cars on the lead lap, and the next car to be lapped will be the number 26, driven by Ricky Rudd. So indeed, Harry Gant is pretty much making... Uh, well, good progress here, making a shambles of this race. Yes, he has pulled away from Alan Kowicki by about seven or eight seconds, just moving through traffic. That car handling so well for him, and he's driving the wheels off it. We've completed 215 laps as Harry Gant laps the number two car driven by Ernie Irvin. 215 are completed. We'll take another break and be back in just a moment. continues to lead the Trans South 500, and here's our Napa race summary. 
Harry had led 31 of the 210 laps at an average speed of 128.062 miles an hour. Eight leaders, 11 lead changes. Seven cars are currently on the lead lap, and we have had only three caution periods for 19 laps. No serious crashes to this point. Cars that have dropped out of the race include Dale Jarrett, number 29, Phil Parsons at 55, and Neil Bonded at 21, so you can see that the attrition rate hasn't been all that bad, at least for this racetrack. Now, Daryl Waltrip was involved in an incident with Phil Parsons, as a matter of fact, early in the race. There you can see Phil moving to the inside of the 90 car driven by Chad Little, and watch Phil Parsons touch the number 15 car, slide up the banking right into the path of Daryl Waltrip. Waltrip was in the pits for many, many laps. However, he has no front end on that car, but he is back in competition going for the points. Phil Parsons had to drop out of the competition. Another angle of that incident, which occurred earlier in the race, Parsons in 55. Brett Bodine in car number 15. There you can see that Dale just, Darrell rather, just runs out of racetrack as Phil came sliding up on top of him. Now, the three car of Dale Earnhardt also had an incident with the wall. There in turn number one, as a matter of fact, right there where uh, Harry Gant is at the moment and also was in the pits for several laps, but Dale Earnhardt is also back out on the racetrack, but many, many laps down. Both Darrell Waltrip and Earnhardt back in competition after the early incidents. And almost into the wall a lap or so ago was the number 83 car driven by Lake Speed. Look at that. Oh, sideways down the main straightaway, and the car almost got out from under him. Yes, it did. Looked like he and Greg Sachs, the blue car right behind him, might have gotten together just a little bit as they came down the front straightaway, and Lake gathered it back in and kept it going. Yeah, if we had interviewed, if he had hit the wall and interviewed Lake Speed, he would have been jumping on the 88 car as well. Back uh, when Darrell Walton had his problem, he said he was a blue car, and he thought it was 88. That was incorrect, but that was Greg Sachs there that had the problem with Lake Speed. And we're giving you now the field rundown after 210 laps as we continue to watch Harry Gann lead this race. His finishes this year, he was 12th at Daytona. He was 31st at Rockingham, 29th at Atlanta, and his uh, 14th place finish just last week in Richmond. But again, as we mentioned, that these finishing positions don't necessarily reflect how well that car has run at some points during this 89 season. Can he hold on to win this race? If he does, it'll be his first win since September of 1985. Back in a moment to Darlington, South Carolina. PN Speed World at Darlington, South Carolina for the Trans South 500 as we are now 227 laps into the race. Jack Aroot is in Rusty Wallace's pit and here he comes for another stop. Well, he surprised the crew by about a lap and a half because they were discussing what they were going to do. They naturally are going to the right sides, check, taking those tires off as Harold Elliott, the engine man, cleans the front grill and checks the left sides. He makes a check and they've elected only to take right sides on this stop and Rusty Wallace Wallace is away in a fairly good stop under green fly conditions. Rusty Wallace came in in fifth position. Now goes back out onto the racetrack. And he was just about to go a lap down. Harry Gant had almost caught him before he came into the pits. Now Harry Gant, as Rusty gets his speed back up, is coming off of turn two. He's going to go about two laps down here if he's not careful. Of course, he will have those two new right side tires. That should uh, keep him out there so he can stay ahead of Harry. He's about uh, three or four seconds ahead of him now, so he should be okay. Looks like he is going to make it. That was a good gamble on their part if the left sides are not worn out because they could don't need to go two laps down at this stage of the race. Just change two tires and maybe somewhere along they'll catch a caution flag and only be one lap down. Or maybe Harry Gant will have to pit and then the caution flag will come out and they'll be in the uh, back in the lead lap. You know, we have had relatively few caution flags for a dar Darlington race and no serious crashes. I still think that we're seeing what we did in the very early stages of the race and that is these drivers are being very conservative. There you can see Sterling Marlin in car number 94 goes a lap down to the field, and he is in fifth position, and so there are only four cars on the lead lap. As I mentioned earlier on in the show, this year has been a strange year because the competition that we talk so much about just hasn't been there. Rusty Wallace, Alan Kowicki, Harry Gant at, at uh, Rockingham, Ricky Rudd's car, at Daytona Ken Schrader's car. That's about it. So many people are disappointed with their season. Bill Elliott, 
Kyle Petty, Michael Walter, the Stravola boys, the Miller High Life cars. Uh, Alexander had his problem and is still not driving the automobile. Sterling Marlin just went a lap down. We felt like he was going to be a driver that could win any place. Davy Allison, a great runner last year, just haven't hasn't had the good runs this year. But on the other hand, here's a guy who is with a brand new team this year, and he has been good in every race. Here again, he has been good. Well, I think it's a tribute to Leo and Andy. And they felt they felt like that Harry Gant was a very good race car driver, and that he could do a job for them. Harry went in, and, and evidently they've hit it off. There's good communication between those three. Is there any way you can explain what you just talked about? The fact that uh, the guys like uh, Terry Labonte, uh, Rick Wilson, who we expected to see win a race maybe early in going, just haven't been up to speed so far. And year. Ricky Rudd, there's yeah. another one. So, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, can I explain it? If I could, <laughs> I'd be a consultant. Be here, I would be you? here. I'd be a consultant. Here's the eight car of Bobby Hillen Jr. And talk about a guy who should be congratulated on a run. Bobby Hillen Jr. is in the pit. Jerry Punch is there. And Harry Hyde orchestrate the tire changing here on the Miller High Life Buick of Bobby Hill. And they clean the grill, clean the windshield, right side tires, get all the fuel. They're watching that fuel can. The fuel still going in the car. They're revving the motor, trying to get the last drop of fuel in. He's down and away. Bobby Hill is running a great race here in Arlington. Two right side tires and is gone. And folks, that fellow that changed the right front tire on that automobile, another famous name in racing, that was Timmy Petty. The son of Maurice Petty that changes the front tire on that car. And he did a good job. He, he did, did a super job. Bobby Hillen Jr., when he won that Talladega race, became the youngest Winston Cup winner ever. Here comes Davey Allison. We'll go to our crew cam. This is Robert Yates wearing it. will change four tires this time. They only took on two tires when they made their last pit stop. So you can see Robert Yates come around to the other side. Already has it jacked up. Look at him checking both ends of the car yes, to sir. see if there was a okay. Yep. Well, that was a good pit stop. Yes, it was. And what great. That camera is fantastic. Is Did you see him looking right, looking left, back to the right? Wow, it's unbelievable. No bigger than that thing is. Boy, talk about technology and racing. But there's also been some great technology in uh, television the last few years. Hey, Bob Jenkins, you know, we had the Gillette right guard thing at, at uh, halfway. You need to go into the grocery store and get you a buy some right guard and uh, get you a coupon. Is it that bad in here? Oh, you mean to buy a coupon? Yeah, that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> Gant still has a lead. Let's take a look at this once again. Now, Robert Yates goes to the left side of the car. Watch him get the car up on jacks. Then check both ends of the car. Back, back, back and forth. <laughs> then he drops the jack and the car rolls away. <laughs> wow, that's um. But he has to make sure that the jack, that's his job. He has to make sure that all 10 of those lug nuts are tight. And folks, that wrench doesn't tighten them all at one time. They have to tighten each one individually, and he has to make sure all 10 of them are tight. We can talk about that coupon a little bit more. You go in and pick up a coupon, and you write down who you think is going to be the pole sitter for a particular race, and then it goes into a hat with everybody else who picked that driver. And if your name is chosen out, you do win $10,000, just as the driver does at leading at the halfway point. The leader at the halfway point was Harry Gant, and he still continues to lead at Darlington. Back at Darlington Raceway, we're under caution here, and Harry Gant, the leader, is on pit road. It'll be a four-tire change for Harry Gant. The caution brought out by a spin out of turn four. Rodney Coles getting tapped by Jimmy Horton in turn four. Left side tire now going on Harry Gant's car, the Skull Crew, hustling to get Gant back out and in front of the field. Harry having the best day he's had in four years. Down of the way, let's go up pit road to Jack Aroon. And Jerry, what a break this caution was for Alan Kowicki and his team. They thought they were running out of fuel, and they were also out of tires. In fact, they found a brand new set of Goodyears, but they're going to put scuffed Goodyears on right now because they hadn't finished the work sizing up the new tires that they got from Darrell Waltrip's team. So they're going to go with some tires that they used in practice, had about five laps on them, but they were able to do this under the guise of caution after Kowicki had actually slowed dramatically. But he may get lapped nevertheless. Let's see, they've got the go sign out, so he will go by. But he did go a lap down, Jack, because the pace car went down, went by while he was in the pit area. He maybe should have tried to go another lap and catch up to the field. He was over a half a lap behind Harry Gant when he came in. And 
and I uh, think that was a little misjudgment there. He needed to go another lap. Could have been a costly mistake for him. Jeff Bodine, the number five car, moves back out onto the racetrack after having completed uh, his pit stop. Uh, Sterling Marlin also going out. The 27 car of Rusty Wallace is still on pit road as they're changing the tires on the right side of that car. Let's see if it's a four tire change. Yes, it will be. Harry Dotson moves to the left side now and the Rubber is being replaced on the left side of the Kodiak Pontiac. Bill Elliott pulling out of the Coors number nine red car. There goes Michael Waltrip by in the number 30 car. And on the back stretch, we see that the number 71 car driven by Dave Marcus is stalled for some reason. Can't explain that at the moment, but uh, well, it looks like he's about to get it to going. Maybe it's just uh, just stopped. I don't know. The car apparently is not. Uh, Running now, he has it fired and pulls it down to the inside of the racetrack or attempts to get it off of the groove. He was sitting right out in the groove as we saw the other cars coming. Fortunately, it was under caution. There has been a lot of refueling that has gone on this afternoon, but no incidents like there was a couple of weeks ago in Atlanta. And perhaps that's the one thing fire that dr drivers and race crews fear the most. After Richard Petty's accident at Atlanta, crew members are thinking more seriously about protecting themselves on pit road. Fire, an essential element of existence. But uncontrolled or in the wrong place, it can be destructive and harmful. In the early Winston Cup racing days, fires occurred when gasoline dump cans didn't have the safety devices of today. Today's dump cans, though, have a dry brake, spring-loaded, quick disconnect, which shuts off fuel flow when it's not properly inserted into the car's receptacle. Accidents do still occur, however, just like they did several years ago in this incident with Ned Jarrett at Riverside, California. Bill Simpson has been making Nomex suits for drivers and crew members for several years. To prove their safety, he set himself on fire and burned for 20 seconds without injury. It's this type of suit NASCAR fuel refillers are being urged to use. Other protective items are also available. A full face helmet with skirt to protect the face, eyes, and the neck. Gloves, of course, to protect the hands. And there are also shoes and underwear to protect the wearer. A rubberized Nomex apron is the latest innovation. It prevents fuel from soaking into the Nomex in case of a spill. A Velcro fastener allows the victim to tear off the apron quickly and to get away from the fire. Steps have been taken to reduce the possibility of fires on pit road. But accidents will continue to happen. It's up to individual crew members to protect themselves and to take advantage of the technology that's available today. And it's so good to see that most of the refuelers now have that protection on for this race as Alan Kowicki has come in for another stop and is being held at the exit to the pit area until the field goes by. I think he came back in and put on some sticker good years. They mentioned a moment ago that he was putting on some that had been uh, run prior to that. Jack Root, what is the story there? That's exactly the case. Remember we were saying they finally found some Goodyear tires. They've been searching for about, oh, 100 laps or so for them. They got them from Daryl Waltrip, and then they didn't have time to size them up, to put the lug nuts on, let the glue dry, everything else. The caution comes out. They've got, they're scurrying around for Goodyear tires to put on. They elect to go with the scuffs because they felt that they could come back in under the guise of caution and put the stickers on later. But you asked a little bit before that, why didn't he stay out? Well, he was literally out of fuel. He was, he was really coughing and sputtering as he came down pit road so they just couldn't even chance that so they had to actually chance going a lap down a tough break for alan kawicki another guy that's had a lot of tough breaks he's well he's with jerry punch one of the crew members with jerry punch from dale earnhardt's crew jerry well he's trying not to have any more tough breaks jack in fact we're talking about chocolate myers danny myers the gas man for dale earnhardt we saw that we saw that fire feature a few minutes ago and chocolate uh, you've been one of the leaders among the gas men on pit road about trying to get everybody to wear the fireproof suits and the fire hats and etc not everybody wears as much as you do as far as wearing the simpson nomex gloves and the underwear and everything but uh, it's very very important you were very close to the richard petty scene down in atlanta in fact you helped to put the fire out down there i know you feel very comfortable wearing this kind of gear but uh, you wouldn't go on pit road anymore with Without it, would you? No, I tell you, after uh, after seeing the fire at uh, Atlanta, and we had a fire, you know, last year at Michigan, and one year before that, I think at Talladega, and everybody now realizes just how dangerous the fire situation is, and we're going to do everything we can to, you know, do our part to, to control it. 
Well, I guarantee you, people like him on Pit Road, even the even the pit reporters, what the uh, the latest dress in pit reporter here is uh, the Simpson fire suit, as Jack Root and I have been wearing today and will for, be wearing forever now on NASCAR events. And I'm certainly glad I got it on. I feel a little more comfortable. It's a little warm here, and uh, but I'm very, very comfortable having this fire suit on, as I'm sure Chocolate Myers is as well. An ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, that's for sure. Now our hat's off to Chocolate, too. As Jaron mentioned, he was one of the very first to grab a fire extinguisher and go into that petty fire to help extinguish it. We'll be right back. Will Robbie Knievel jump over the Caesars Palace Fountains at leap of about 150 feet? Well, he's going to try to do it on Friday, April the 14th, and you can see it on a live pay-per-view basis. Contact your local cable system to get this spectacular. Robbie Knievel attempting to jump over the Caesars Palace Fountains. You ever uh, tried anything like that, Benny? <laughs> I wouldn't get out of the electric chair to try something like that. <laughs> How about you, Ned? <laughs> No, I tell you, I, I've, I've uh, tried a few tricks here at Darlington, Bob, but yeah. nothing like that. Nothing that would compare to that. Now, we have quite a discussion going on here between a NASCAR official, and that's Waddell Wilson and Steve Beal. Steve Beal's crew chief on the Mark Martin car. Waddell Wilson, of course, crew chief on Jeff Bodine's car, and Jack Arug is there. Jeff, what's all that about? Well, Dan, actually, what they're doing is they're discussing whether they are indeed a lap down or not. Now, you know, the situation was that Harry Gant pitted under the, under the conditions there, and when Harry pitted, NASCAR reverts back to the next car in line, and that's the situation that's now being discussed by Waddell Wilson and Steve Meal. and uh, they're, they're, one thing that's great about NASCAR this year is they said, we will make every attempt to straighten it out before we go back to green flag conditions, and that's in essence what's going on right here and causing the extension of this caution period. We'll try and uh, sneak a listen and uh, report back to you what we hear or overhear during this privileged conversation between these two great crew chiefs and NASCAR. Okay, Ned, the question, I, I realized that the 33 car pitted before the caution car came on the racetrack, and his pit is before the start-finish line. Now my question is, was the 28 car in the same lap with him? I don't think so, because he made a green flag pit stop, and Harry Gant had not. So uh, the fact that Harry's pit was before you get to the start-finish line, the start-finish line goes all the way across the racetrack, even through the pit area, and he stopped before he got there, and if those cars got back, to that before he did, then it's my opinion that they unlapped themselves, and that's what Waddell Wilson and Steve Mill are arguing about, and they're still holding the caution out here to get that all cleared away. Harold Kinder does have the caution flag raised high in the air, but now he begins to get the signal of one more lap to go before we restart this Trend South 500. Thing. While you were away, here is the restart on lap 249. Green coming out of the Trans South 500 is resuming. Harry Gant is the only car on the lead lap according to NASCAR scoring. Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, Greg Sachs, and Bill Elliott are all a lap down. But look at Davey Allison trying to get his lap back on the inside again. He has position on the inside. Got the spot, and I saw some smoke coming out of that 28 car the last time by, I do believe. Seem to be affecting his speed, though. No, it certainly doesn't. Jeff Bodine is in second position. He's the third car there on the track. The fourth car in your picture is the 84 of Dick Trickle. And Jeff Bodine is in second position, but a lap down also. And here's Trickle moving to the inside of Jeff Bodine and going too wide into turn number three. Trickle has that pass made successfully. That's an impressive move for a rookie, don't you think, Ned? Yeah, it really was. He's uh, adapting to this track pretty quickly. Yeah, you can see some of the other cars pulling out the pass. Ricky Rudd back there in the green Winter State car making a move. Here's Nick Trickle high on the racetrack in turn number two, right behind leader Harry Gant. Now, we mentioned a moment ago that that uh, discussion was going on down Pitt Road there about whether Jeff Bodine and maybe Mark Martin and a couple of others got to the start-finish line since Harry Kent was pitting before he got to the start-finish line. We understand that the leaders are scored as they go by the scoring stand, which is further on up Pitt Road and uh, at the end of Pitt Road before you even get to the pits, as a matter of fact. And Harry Kent had passed there. He was in the lead when he came by that position. That's, that's exactly right. That's the point that you and I... We're not taking into consideration that they are scoring it. Ooh, that was mm. close. Jeff Bodine, something that's uh, not uh, just right on his car because look there, everybody's going by. He motioned to yeah, Sterling Marlin and say, go ahead, you got the spot. 
Just don't run over me. <laughs> but now here comes Jeff back on the inside. But he did uh, put his hand out the window and uh, and signal Sterling Marlin to go by. Here's the 15 car of Brett Bodine, his brother, right behind Jeff. Here's a replay. There we see the sax car come alongside Jeff on it. Jeff just isn't getting off that corner. Watch how close the left front and right rear of those cars. I think they touched. They touched. They did. Yes. And yeah, there's Jeff signaling, hand out the window, signaling to Sterling Marlin to go on. Well, he might have been signaling to Greg Saxon <laughs> yeah. in front of him. Yeah, the signal might have been for the guy in front of him, not the one coming up behind him. We couldn't exactly see uh, what perhaps digit he was using on his hand there, but nevertheless, he did make some kind of a signal out the window. Bob, we had that feature on the fire situation a little bit earlier. Of course, we saw the fire of Richard Petty in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Robert Calicut was a member that was burned. He's in Augusta, Georgia in the burn center there. And we want to say hello to Robert this afternoon. We understand they've been doing some skin crafting on him. And Robert, we hope we'll see you back out here before too long. Also want to say hello to Billy Esker, who's a charter member of the Darlington Raceway Green Flag Club. He has been in the hospital, Florence General Hospital, for the past two weeks, and today is the first day that he's allowed to watch television, and we're happy that he's able to tune in to the Trans South 500. This is the first race that he's missed here at Darlington in 20 years, and Billy, we're sorry that you couldn't be with us here today. Hope you get out of the hospital real soon. We saw we saw Jeff Bodine's windshield. It looked like it was darker. See how much darker it is than some of the rest of it? And let me tell you, folks, when you're behind that car, you're running blind. I don't know if that's, if this windshield is there we see half a half, is it half of it black? Yeah. Okay, now the, the guy behind him can't see through that. And really, truly, you have to depend on looking through there to be able to see what's in front. As, as we see Rusty Wallace, he's got just a little bit of a window there. I okay. thought NASCAR, that, I thought that was illegal. Man. Well, I didn't know that they were, were, could put the tinted in, uh, glasses in there, but I'm sure it's for the, the late evening sun as you're going to turn one. It is tough going into that turn this time of day as you're looking into the sun. It is, but I'll tell you what, those tinted windshields make it awfully difficult for those people behind you. Richard Petty used to have those tinted windshields in his car. Oh, look at the smoke off yep. that tire. I guess that was tire smoke, but a lot of smoke off old Einstein's car. I guess that's something that those of us who have never been race drivers don't realize, but you would have to look through the car ahead of you to see what's in front of that car. Of course, you're a foot behind the guy in front of you, and there's no way to see except through his windshield. And whoa, Rusty Wallace and Sterling Marlin, very close coming off turn four. Rusty making a good run to the front. Any laps down as he did? We have him just one lap down, I believe. Yeah, he, he had made a green flag pit stop before that last caution came out. And uh, I think that he did keep from going two laps down. He Kenny Martin said he's a lap down. Look at this. Wow, he is running hard. He sure is. On the high side of the racetrack, that's Rodney Combs in 34 that caused the most recent caution period when he spun and uh, hit the wall slightly down to turn four. You can see the damage there on the front end of that 34 car as he hit the inside wall coming off the corner. Those three cars we're seeing there, Rusty Wallace, Sterling Marlin in car number 44, Jeff Bodine in car number five. They're running in the third, fourth, and fifth positions. One lap down, Greg Sachs, the scoreboard is showing, is being in the second position out in front of him. So a very interesting race has developed after 259 laps. Only one car is on the lead lap, and that is Harry Gant in car number 33. So... About 10 cars that are only one lap down. Including Davey Allison, who is just in front of Harry Gant. Uh, he is uh, almost two laps down, fighting for his life out there to, to stay just one lap down. Davey currently running in the 11th position. We'll be back with more of the Trans South 500 as we're live from Darlington, South Carolina on this Sunday afternoon. Stay with us. We have caution on the racetrack and pit stops that have just been completed. There's the leader, Harry Gant, 33, going back out onto the racetrack after having made a stop. This caution was brought out by Hut Strickler, who got sideways over in corner number two and uh, continued on. But nevertheless, it did bring out another caution period. And Harry Gant and Alan Kowicki and Rusty Wallace and most of the others came in for a stop. And we have a replay of, uh, of the uh, incident involving Hut Strickland. 
You can see the car down on the inside of the racetrack spinning around. It rights itself, gets uh, headed in the right direction, but the caution came out while he was spinning around. And the crew cam on Robert Yates as Davey Allison is in for a tire change. Going to the left side now. Well, the helicopter that transmits our signals has just landed for some fuel and is not quite up to altitude to give us the real good pictures. There it begins to come in as Davey Allison pulls away. Bill Elliott is also in for a stop as they have completed a four tire change and Bill Elliott roars back into competition. Bill was running in the sixth position one lap down. And there is the helicopter that we just mentioned after it is uh, now getting into a higher altitude after having made a pit stop itself for some fuel. Yeah, you know, we talked about Bill Elliott and uh, he's not setting the world on fire, but nevertheless is turning in the best performance of the year so far. Yeah, he's not doing too bad. He's uh, has not been running as fast as Harry Gant, Rusty Wallace and some of the others, but he has been very consistent out there and, and has only gone one lap down. And well, it appears as if NASCAR is still having a bit of discussion over the scoring of this race, and if indeed Harry Gant is the only car on the lead lap. So, Hut Strickland's uh, incident over in turn number two brings out the caution, but perhaps the scoring situation that NASCAR is talking about will keep it out just a little bit uh, longer than normal. Harry Gant uh, beat Rusty Wallace back out of the pit, so he's right out in front of him. If he is uh, the only car on the lead lap, well, he's in good shape. Harry Gant under caution here at Darlington, and today's track fact features the crew chief on the car that's being driven by Kyle Petty, and also the guy that's an occasional ESPN analysis, Gary Nelson. He answers an often asked question concerning engines. Track facts are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. I've been asked, how long does a Winston Cup car last? Well, what we've done here is taken an engine apart to show you some of the pieces. These pistons may only last 500 miles. The connecting rods, about 1,500 miles. Something like this crankshaft, about 2,500 miles. A set of heads, barring no failures, would last maybe two or three races. Uh, engine block like this, about 2,000 miles. To put all this into perspective, everything here will probably be junk at the end of the season, except for maybe this valve cover or the roof on the race car. Well, Gary's driver, Kyle Petty, finds himself in 15th position, two laps down in this race. And Gary will be with us in the broadcast booth next week at Bristol. Jack Root has a previous commitment. Benny Parsons will go to the pits, and Gary will join us in the booth. We'll be right back. at Darlington uh, as the race is 266 laps old. Now Cliff Drysdale and Mary Carrillo are down in Florida standing by to bring us some tennis action right after this race. Cliff, what's going on? Thank you, Bob. I'm enjoying the race just along with you. There have been some interesting happenings here these last couple of weeks at the Cliff. Cliff. Certainly an interesting development there with that uh, accident that uh, did cause this exhibition match. At Darlington International Raceway in South Carolina, we are under caution on lap 267, and the reason for this lengthy caution period is because of a scoring question that has developed. Now, NASCAR is continuing to talk about this situation with crew chiefs like uh, Waddell Wilson, and it appears as if several are going to be given a lap back. Let's go to Jack Aru. You see these two guys? Glenn Carter's a NASCAR official, and this is Waddell Wilson, and they've been joined at the hip like this for about the last five or six laps. And I, I think now Glenn has given the word to Waddell as far as what the situation is. Did you get your lap back? Well, you know, NASCAR is reviewing it right now on tape to see if I'm right. But the way I've seen it, you know, the 33 did not pit on this side of the start-finish line. He's on the other side, so that means he didn't cross it. We came across and was able to make our lap up just the same as if we had passed him before we come to start finish line on the racetrack. But the great thing that's happening down here, and this is a change, a departure, as Ned and I think Benny can say and you can attest to as well, they're really trying to work this out. It isn't a thing to just take it this way or leave it. They've really tried to work it out over and over again. Oh, yes. You know, they're definitely trying to do it as right as they know how, but they're going to review it to make sure that I'm not trying to do anything wrong, in which I'm not. You know, I see it one way and I feel I'm right. I, 
and they're taking me for my word, and they're seeing if that is right. Now, let me explain to you what Waddell's alluding to as far as reviewing the tape. NASCAR now has a complete three-quarter inch videotape system at the start-finish line. It runs continuously and logs the lap and the time of day, much which we're used to when we're editing features like that one on fire safety we saw. And they have a man that sits there all day under a little hooded cover and watches TV. But when they have a question like this, they have to rewind the tape, take a look at it, play it back and forth. Kind of an instant replay, a throw-off, Benny, from what we see in the NFL, don't you think? Well, Jack, my my question is, where is the, where do you get the lap back? Is it the, at the start finish line or down in front of the score stand in the fourth corner? It's my understanding that the the point of determination is in front of the score stand in the fourth corner, and therefore the videotape doesn't do any good. If they go by the video, yes, Jeff Bodine got to the start finish line, but Harry again passed the score stand before Jeff Bodine did. Well, I'm going to have to plead ignorance, and under normal <laughs> conditions, you know, your your booth would be located right next to NASCAR's, and we could get a quick answer to that. But today, that's impossible, and it would really be Dick Beatty or Les Richter or Morris Metcalf that could answer that question. But, Ned, maybe you've got the answer. I'm going to throw it off to you. Maybe you've got the answer. Well, I made the statement a moment ago when I tried to correct the thing that, that it was handled at the scoring stand. Certainly, when NASCAR gets their information, they get it from the chief scorer who is just off for of the fourth turn and so that's the information that they have to go by but it is officially scored at the start finish line as far as the leader of the race is concerned and so they're reviewing the tape and i think they are correct in doing this and letting those cars they are going to let some other go around i understand and give them their lap back well greg Sachs has already went around the pace car and is getting a lap back but that's the only car I see right now that, that they are allowing to go by the pace car. All right, so the scoring snafu is being dealt with here. And, you know, in the track back that we saw just a few minutes ago, we saw Gary Nelson explaining some of the engine parts that are essential to uh, the running of a Winston Cup race. But there are parts other than that that are also essential. And here's Benny. NAPA says we're going to spend about $66 a year average on our automobiles. You know, to rebuild a race car after the Trans-South 500, it will probably take $10,000. NAPA also says that it takes about 6,500 cars to support a small NAPA jobber. And this week at Darlington, there's only 82 race cars here, but there's four parts trucks. That's four small parts stores following those 82 cars for their business goes to show you just how many parts these race cars go through. They may even go through enough that the trucks run out of some parts. And Benny, those parts cost a little bit more than those in the NAPA store. They are what's called heavy duty. And I now see why you are wearing your hat during our stand-up opens. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> the uh, yellow remains out. 270 laps have gone by. The fans are taking a little bit of a break away from the action as the scoring problem is sorted out. Road at Darlington, the discussion continues with a lot of the major crew chiefs on the Winston Cup Tour as the Winston Cup officials continue to review the scoring problems here. Not really a problem, trying to get it straightened away. Before we went to break, you heard Bob Jenkins talk about the fact that Benny Parsons needs a hat and wears a hat during his, his opens here. Well, I've got a great idea that we want to throw out to you viewers. Why don't all of you get together and pick your favorite hat that you'd like to see Benny wear during those opens and send it to us. Now, we're going to have a couple of ground rules here because, you know, Benny's kind of a sensitive type guy. It's got to be a legitimate hat with no advertising on it. We don't want any ball caps because he's not a draw. He's not a driver anymore. So no ball caps, hats, and uh, you know we'll send them into Benny, and uh, maybe Benny can wear one, a new one, in each telecast. My vote, Bob Jenkins, for the first hat is this one right here. And when we get a, when he gets a little carried away, we can push that down. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. At least we can uh, cover partially his face there. Now, the address that you uh, send these hats to would be Hat of the Week in care of Benny Parsons, 112 Main Street in Ellerby, North Carolina. The zip code is 28338. Now, Benny wears a 7.5 to a 7 and 3 eight size. I thought you had a lot bigger hat than that. So what are you going to do with these when you're done with them? Well, no, I'm not going to. Folks, I'm not going to send you the hats back. Right. I often get requests for some type of something to for celebrity auctions. People want a shirt or a hat or something. I'm going to send the hats that I wear on the show to the request that I get for something for a celebrity auction, and it'll be auctioned off for some charity. 
That's How's a, that? That's a good idea. And I'm going to try to wear a hat, folks, that, are, that is appropriate to your area. You know, from Dover and from Pocono, uh, some, something that's appropriate for those areas. That should be fun. Well, yes. let's go to our crew cam right now as, uh, well, no, nothing happening right at the moment as Davey Allison came in for a brief stop and now is uh, going back out onto the racetrack. Well, we are again under caution because of a scoring discussion that's going on. And Jerry Punch can uh, fill us in on more about what happened and how NASCAR is dealing with it. Well, Bob, NASCAR is trying to untangle the scoring here, and the way they do it, in the old days, they had to run a tape, meaning that had someone set on a tower and write down as each car came by the start-finish line, which was very difficult to do, particularly with long events and caution flights, etc. Now they have a very expensive system. This camera you see on top of this platform shoots directly across the start-finish line. It is a frame-by-frame, single-advance video camera. Now, below the camera here, underneath that hood, is NASCAR official Timmy Arp. Now, Timmy is looking at a video camera through, like, a VHS system, much like you might have at home and he could advance it frame by frame now he's been one of the busiest guys these last few minutes as crew chief after crew chief to come by to view what timmy arp has been looking at inside that hood the nascar people up in the tower are viewing it as timmy will show you there as each lap in the cars come by his camera will shoot across the start finish line here as they come zipping by and he can back it up or forward it frame by frame and determine who was on the lead lap who was not and it also shoots across pit road and they can see the leader come down pit road so a very very advanced system to determine scoring here at NASCAR. Well, I'm sure when Harry Gant came down pit road, he knew the caution was coming out. He could get into the pits and get out before the caution car would come back around. He didn't even think about the fact that he was pitting before he got to the start finish line and uh, wasn't thinking about all those cars he had a lap down. Now, I'm sure that they're rethinking now. Hey, I wish I would have stayed out there one lap, kept those cars a lap down, and then I would be in a lap all by myself. But now he's not going to be. He's now probably talking about the next time I pick a pit, I will make doggone sure it's past the start finish line. Well, the caution, as you can see, still out, but uh, you know, it's always nice to come down here to Darlington, South Carolina, and to other locations that we cover in the course of a Winston Cup schedule. And here's a little feature of what's going on outside the track. Often our telecasts only show you the racetrack, but let's take you beyond the gates to show you what's in the immediate vicinity of Darlington. The city is located in the northeastern portion of South Carolina near Florence and west of Myrtle Beach. As we leave the speedway, just outside the track is the Joe Weatherly Hall of Fame that attracts fans even when there is no action on the racetrack. And then there are the many souvenir stands where you can buy official Winston Cup paraphernalia, including jackets, sunglasses, and even headset radios. Sponsors and drivers also bring their souvenirs here so that if you want a t-shirt from your favorite competitor, all you need is money. And just outside the racetrack is a much quieter and more pastoral setting. A lake attracts fishermen who find this challenge just as exciting as winning a Winston Cup race. It's springtime. The dogwood is in bloom. And that makes this area around Darlington, South Carolina even more beautiful. There are some of the souvenir stands that are just outside of Darlington International Raceway as uh, they're doing quite a bit of business even now as this caution period continues here at Darlington. We'll be right back. Today at Darlington Raceway for the Trans South 500 Winston Cup race and with 275 laps to go, we're under an extended caution because of a scoring snafu. Now, coming up this Thursday night, beginning uh, at 10 o'clock live, we'll have the USAC Western States Midget Races from Ascot Park in Gardena, California. You short track fans have been asking us for even more than we have done the past couple of years at Indianapolis Raceway Park. We're going to give you more. Nine midget races live from Ascot Park beginning April 6th, and then later we'll have 10 midget and sprint car races from Indianapolis Raceway Park. A total of 18 Thursday night Thunder events. The USAC Midgets coming up this Thursday night at 10 o'clock live Eastern Time. Well, Dr. Jerry Punch can update us on uh, the situation uh, on pit road. Jerry? 
Well, we've been eavesdropping here in the Harry Gant pits, and what you're looking at is NASCAR official Art Krebs as he's been explaining to Andy Petrie and, and Leo Jackson here exactly what's happened. And Andy is not a happy camper right now. They have sent a number of cars back around Gant and put them back in the lead lap. And what Art Krebs has said is that, look, uh, the cameras don't lie, fellas. The camera over there will show you, and I can take you over there and show you on the camera, which we just showed the folks at home exactly what happened. So they're not really happy about these cars getting back in the lead lap with Gant, but uh, they have an explanation for it. Of course, it's obviously it's on the video, but that's what's going on up in the Gantz pit. They're still discussing it here. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Well, Jerry, you're lucky you only have one group. You see one group here that's been around for a while. Now we've got two groups of team members discussing with two Winston Cup officials. It seems as if nobody's happy yet, but let me see if I can explain one of the reasons why maybe you get into a scoring situation like this. When you have an extended green flag period, such as we've had, a lot of times when you make several stops like this, especially with the scoring systems that are that are in use today in NASCAR, sometimes it can get a little bit ahead of you, and, and we do use some of the best equipment, but I think, Benny, you know a little bit about a scoring system that they're, they're taking a look at, and and uh, it comes from the race that was held in Australia, a computerized system that we may see in a couple of years. So I'm sorry, Jack, I was not able to hear you. Uh, if you're talking about computers that the Formula One cars use or what have you? Well, actually, they had a system, Benny, down in Australia that was used for the NASCAR race down there. And there's some talk that their prototype may come here and may, may be used in several, several years to come. Well, I, we talked about that at ESPN last year about the possibility of maybe us putting a uh, screen here in the booth and using uh, on the cars, make all the cars put a transponder on them and us just run a check on it to see if it, if it was a credible thing. There we see the five car, now they figure out he's got a lap to <laughs> lead on everybody. <laughs> lead on everybody. So he parked. They're going to go all the way around the racetrack and come back and he'll fall in line wherever he goes, I guess at the, uh, at the rear of the field or at the front of the field. Well. Hey folks, I'm sorry we're confusing you, but uh, I will well, be confused myself. I think everybody is. And uh, the only thing on the scoreboard now is the lap count, 277. Normally they show you the first five positions. Well, there's nothing up there right now. We just know that we've completed lap 277. And at the moment, we're not even sure who the leader of this race is. We do know that Jeff Bodine is being stopped on uh, the starting line. And here comes the field out of corner number four to, uh, to catch up with him. Yeah, there really shouldn't be any question about who who is leading, and Harry Gant should be the leader of the race, but because he had a lap on the field before he made a pit stop. But uh, now that they figured that Jeff Bodine had got a lap on the field as a result of going ahead of other cars, so they've taken that back away from him. We'll get it all figured out here before too long, and we'll go back to racing. The reason that this caution period was brought out was by a spin for Hut Strickland, but it's evolved into a much more lengthy caution period than first anticipated. The green flag is just about to come out. We have run 18 laps under caution for that minor Hut Strickland problem over in turn number two, but most of these yellow flag laps have been because of the scoring problem that occurred and the questions that arose and now NASCAR apparently believes that they have the thing all straightened out and we are about to go back to racing. To be quite honest with you, we don't know yet who's leading this race, but there is the green from Harold Kinder. Harry Gant should be, we think, but the car that leads them across the stripe on the high side of the racetrack is the number 84 car driven by Dick Trickle. Now here comes Mark Mark to the inside, passing Terry Labonte. As Labonte gets caught up high, everything, everybody moving through turns one and two in pretty good shape. There's Bobby Hillen Jr. in number eight. Here comes Rusty Wallace in the 27, Kyle Petty in the 42, and Alan Kowicki in the seven car. And boy, Harry Gant was caught back there on the high side of the racetrack and couldn't go anywhere for a little bit. And here he comes to the inside of uh, Alan Kowicki to the inside of Terry Labonte. That's Kyle Petty dropping low on the racetrack, passing Bobby Hillen Jr. That car is working very well for Kyle Petty. That was impressive. Kyle Petty and that peak unit in Pontiac came off the corner and just blew by Hillen. Okay, and the here goes Harry Gant by. The leader of the race is Harry Gant. Second position, according to NASCAR, is Bill Elliott. Third is Jeff Bonine. Fourth is Davey Allison. Fifth is Sterling Marlin. And sixth is Greg Sachs. So, uh, Kyle Petty in 42 and uh, Rusty Wallace in 27 are on the tail end, it appears, of the lead lap. There's Harry moving high on the racetrack and passing the number 31 car by Jim Sauter, the Silver U figure Salon Pontiac. You, you just had 
had to think that when this thing was over, that Harry Gant was going to have to be the leader of the race. Yeah, he, he was. He had a lap on the field before that one time. It was actually the caution before is where the scoring situation came up, not this particular one, but they used that opportunity to try to get things straightened out. And that's Alan Kowicki close by in car number seven. But our uh, statistics and uh, the word from NASCAR tells us that Allen is not on the lead lap. Well, I think he came down pit road the same time that Harry Gant did during that other caution when we had the confusion. So that uh, left him a lap down that we saw him lose on uh, that one caution. Okay, so Gant is the leader in car number 33. In second position now is Jeff Bodine in the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet. He passed the number nine car of Bill Elliott just a lap ago. So Bill Elliott is back in third position in the car number nine. Terry's had a tough day. His, his car just uh, has not run that well since he got to Darlington this week. Jeff Bodine moves inside of Terry going into turn number one and puts Terry between himself and the third place car of Bill Elliott. But there's Elliott now low on the racetrack in turn number two. And he too passes Terry Labonte. Here comes the 25 car of Ken Schrader and the 15 of Brett Bodine. Well, Elliott isn't doing bad at all for a guy with a broken wrist and still suffering from it. Third position, not bad at all on this racetrack with the physical handicap that he has. Doing a good job out there, no question about it. He was one lap down one time, but apparently taking advantage of the situation when Harry Gant came into the pits. And I, I want to tell the folks one more thing about that situation. Don't want to beat a horse to death. But when the caution was about to come out, Harry came into the pits. He didn't come across the start finish line and get the caution flag so the others could race back to the start finish line. And as he slowed down to come into the pits, they passed him and that was legal to do that because they have not got to the start finish line where it is official on the caution flag. So Harry Gant does have the lead. Dick Trickle there, car number 84. We go back and show you the interval between first and the second place car. There it is, the yellow and white machine of Jeff Bodine. And right behind him is Bill Elliott in car number nine. They're racing for that second position. The Bodine's car seemed to be working much better now than when we saw it earlier. A lot of cars were passing him not too long ago under green flag conditions, but it seems like the car's running pretty good for him now. They must have gotten a good set of tires on it. The 88 car now moves into fourth position. That is Greg Sachs, and he is having a fine day. He is having a great day, as a matter of fact. That's by far the best that car has run all year, and I'm sure the Buddy Baker, Danny Ship, and all the Crisco people are very happy. The 94 car will be the fifth place machine. That's Sterling Marlin. He's having a good day as well. Sterling comes into this race fourth in points. He's had a very good consistent season so that now will uh, review for you the top five as they are on the racetrack as this scoring uh, confusion has been all figured out and all those five cars are on the lead lap as a matter of fact if the race would end right now and all the cars keep running Alex Kowicki would be the Western Cup point leader after today and Sterling Marlin would be the second place car because both Earnhardt and Walter have had some serious problems today and will finish far down when the day's over. That's right. Both of them are still on the racetrack, but both Earnhardt and Walter did have incidents with the wall earlier. And how about Rusty Wallace, who has won two races so far this year? Well, Rusty is another one of those guys who has had problems throughout the afternoon, and although he has been among the front runners, it doesn't appear as if this is going to be his day. Well, I don't know. He's still in front of Harry Gant. And how many laps? Kenny Martin, he is only one lap down right now. He's only one lap down. He's on the tail end of the lead lap. So if he can stay in front of Gant and the caution flag come out, we've seen Rusty Wallace win from two, three laps down. So yep. I, he, 
Still not out of it. Yeah, I'm perhaps a little uh, premature in calling him out of the race, but it hasn't been as easy for him as it has been in some of the races that he's come from two laps down. Now we see two cars. Here's Mark Martin, car number six. He's running out in front of Rusty Wallace, and Rusty Wallace is in front of Harry Gant. So both of those fighting to keep themselves out in front, hoping for another caution that they can come all the way around and get back into thick of this thing. They tell me that two laps until the tire rule, whatever tires that the competitors have on right now are two laps from now, that's the tires that they must end the race on. So they can't switch back and forth from Hoosier to Goodyear anymore. In the last hundred miles of a race like this has to be on the, uh, the same tire. You can't change tires in the last, you can't change brands of tires in the last hundred laps competition. So in one more lap, that rule will go into effect. I think Harry has run good years all today, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, I don't think he has changed uh, brands of tires. He started on the good year, and I think he has stayed on them all day, and they certainly have worked well for him. There's the Daryl Walter car that uh, doesn't look even like a race car behind Harry. Daryl got caught between the wall and Phil Parsons early in the race, lost several laps. So we could definitely have a scramble of the Winston Cup points at the conclusion of this race. If Ron Osherlin is watching out in California today, I just saw your car go down pit road for another. That's the Hut Strickland number 57 car in an unscheduled stop on the back straightaway. Well, Jack Arood is down in the uh, Bodine pit with another report on the tires. Jack? Well, this tire rule, now that it's gone into effect, is a good deal for guys like Alan Kowicki that are on Goodyear's and a good deal for a guy like Jeff Bodine that's on Hoosiers. Now, remember we told you many of the teams had equal sets of tires. Well, what Waddell Wilson has done now is he's totally divested himself of the Goodyear's because he didn't use them. And you know who was the recipient of most of them? Not a Hendrick car, but Alan Kowicki. Kowicki now has enough Goodyear's, hopefully, to go the distance. And if you take a look over here, also having enough Hoosiers to go the distance is Jeff Bodine. So it worked out mutually beneficial for both teams. That's a pretty neat deal. They just traded. He took Kowicki's Hoosiers and Kowicki took his Goodyear. That's a good deal. There are eight cars on the lead lap. We showed you five of them. Gant, Jeff, Bill Elliott, Greg Sachs, and Sterling Martin. The other three cars on the lead lap are the 28 of Davey Allison and the six of Mark Martin, the 27 of Rusty Wallace. And we see Rusty Wallace. We saw the white car just in, that's Harry Gant, the leader in that green and white skull car. And right up in front of him, we saw the white car, number 27. That's Rusty Wallace and Mark Martin right in front of him. And those guys are pedaling as hard as they can pedal to stay in this lead lap. been strong since the drop of the green flag. The question is, will the car hold together and will Harry be able to go the distance? And Jack Arute talked at the beginning of the show about the young guys and the young movement. Ain't happening, is hey, it? Hey, he's my age. He's 49 years old. Go, Harry. He's a real oldster, I'll tell you that. But, <laughs> but in the lead and taking the skull bandit, hopefully for him to victory lane. 298 laps completed were 71 away from the end of this race. We'll be right back. Dr. Jerry Punch back at Darlington where Harry Gant in the number 33 Skull Bandit leads the Trans South 500. Here's the best battle on the racetrack. It's for fifth spot. Sterling Marlin has that spot right now, the number 94 car, but Davey Allison is right behind him. And look at the third car there. Now he, needless to say, is not on the lead lap. He's down many, many laps because he hit the wall right there a few laps ago. In fact, uh, quite a while ago. And had to come in for some costly repairs. But nevertheless, Dale Earnhardt is struggling along out there and picking up as many Winston Cup points as he possibly can. But this battle between Sterling Marlin and Davey Allison has gotten quite heated just in the last few laps. It has. In fact, they touched not too many laps ago and got a little bit sideways, but they straightened them out pretty quick and keep at it. Now, here comes Davey Allison down on the inside. He's going to try to make a move on Sterling Marlin. Maybe not this time. 
For those of you who are tuning into ESPN in hopes of seeing the uh, Lipton Players Challenge Tennis from Florida, that will be on right after our conclusion of this race. It is running longer than we had anticipated. Whoop, there's Davy Allison, and he takes over fifth spot now from Sterling Marlin. We're running longer than we had anticipated because we were under yellow quite a while while NASCAR answered some uh, scoring questions that arose on pit road. It's amazing that Richard Childers and that crew could fix Earnhardt's car good enough after he hit the wall as hard as he did. He's out there passing the fifth and sixth place guys. Now that's amazing. Childers and those guys must really know how exactly how the car is set or something to be able to do that. Well, Benny, they have laid out in their pits a complete set of steering and everything ready to bolt on that car, and I'm sure that it's already been adjusted. They probably had it on the race car, set the car up, took it back off, and then laid it out there piece by piece, and then uh, they can just bolt it on there, and the car set up good there. And another good battle going on for seventh position as Rusty Wallace in the 27 car just passed Mark Martin, the number six car, and Rusty now has has seventh and there is Harry Gant however sneaking up on these two drivers to try to put them a lap down. That's why Rusty had to get by because Mark Martin. Oh, oh and Rusty in the wall. the wall. Has a tough time bringing it off the wall. I think he just got into the corner too hard that time. He might have had a tire going down but I believe he just got in there a little bit too hard. He went a lap down. Now then how much damage did he do? That's the question. Is he going to come in the pits or not? I don't think so. Is any sheet metal? Yes, yes. he is. Here comes Rusty after scraping the wall between turns one and two. And Rusty Wallace has fought back gallantly today, but things just don't seem to be going right for him. Jackaroot is in his pits. Well, Rusty Wallace brings the wounded car down onto pit road, and it looks like they're going to the outside where he hit the wall. Barry Dodson working the jack, getting it up. Jimmy Maycar working on the right front. He's got that off. They're trying to pull away the sheet metal from the right front where he rang the wall. With Whitney, and Whitney is a little bit wounded, but they've completed the work, and Wallace is away in 16.5 seconds. Jack, it didn't look like there was too much damage. There is uh, certainly some scraping alongside the car where he hit the wall, but it didn't look like it was bashed in too much. It looked like going into the sun, maybe looking in the rearview mirror a little bit to see where Harry Gant was, and he just got in there a little bit too high and a little bit too hard. I tell you what, Jack. Get one of the cameras there to look at the outside of that tire because all the Goodyear is gone. Okay, let's look at it again. As Rusty Wallace goes into that turn, he goes down in the low side of the track as you normally do, and then the car starts to slide up. He gets up in the loose stuff and gets it into the wall, and uh, he does a good job of riding the wall. He was smart to not cut the steering wheel to the left all of a sudden. He probably would have spun out, so he just sort of rode the wall around there a little bit to get it slowed down and then brought it back down on the racetrack. All right, Bill Elliott in car number nine. The number four car of Rick Wilson is between Bill Elliott and Davy Allison. Wilson is not on the same lap as uh, Elliott and Allison, but uh, those two guys, Elliott and Allison, are on the lead lap and uh, are running uh, for position. You know, the, we saw Rusty Wallace get in the wall in turn one, and as the car rubs the side of the race car on the wall, that's what the people in the pit area laughingly call the Darlington Strike. Mm -hmm. Because used to, when Ned Jarrett was, won his race here in 1965, the third and fourth corner, there was only one groove around the racetrack, and that was right against the guardrail, and you literally almost had to rub the rail to be in the groove. Anymore. Yeah, it was, a, it was a guardrail, a metal guardrail back then where they have the cement wall now. But yes, if you did not come in, even after qualifying, if you didn't come in with the stripe on the side of that car that you had rubbed that guardrail, you had not made a fast lap. That was the only way you could make a fast lap around this racetrack. So you talk about driving a fine line. Now, it was that way. My 65 Ford at the end of the Southern 500 that year, the sheet metal was worn out of it on that side. Now we see Bill Elliott, Rick Wilson, and Davey Allison. Jack Aroot, do you have one of those tires that you took off of Rusty Wallace's car? Well, ben, Benny, let me show you. This is the way they normally look, right, with the big Goodyear and the Eagle and the, and the markings here. Here's the one that came off of Rusty's car. And, uh, well, I, I can see a little white here on, on the winged <laughs> foot, and that's about it. Now, remember, that's the way it looks on the inside and the way it should look on the outside as well until you get a Darlington stripe. 
He left all that white paint on the wall up in turn one. Yep, but that's explained pretty graphically there. You can hardly see it at all. Bill Elliott, car number nine. Here at Darlington, the winner of the Trans South 585, the Southern 585, the Southern 588. In 22 Darlington starts, he has 20 top 10 finishes. Davey Allison, however, is catching him. Davey moves inside and passes the slower car of Rick Wilson. And now, Davey may pull up to challenge Bill for that position. And while we've been talking about these other things, Harry Gant has passed Mark Martin and has put him a lap down. We saw that he was about to as when Rusty Wallace had his problem down there, so he has since done that. And now there are six cars on the lead lap. Well, let's see if Davey will challenge Bill for that fourth position. Not at the moment. Maybe, however, coming off of turn two and down the back stretch. Elliott, though, running well in that number nine car. I believe Davey is going to be content to sit there for just a while. But maybe Bill Elliott is on the comeback. We talked about it in the early part of the show, how he needs to turn things around. Earlier in the weekend, our question to him, has 89 been a major disappointment? Well, you know, looking back on Daytona, it was tough. You know, everything we worked for all, all winter long, you know, trying to test, trying to get ready. We thought we had some good stuff going for Daytona. And everything going away right then, you know. Had to run the same car in the clash as in the, as in the 500 and everything else. So, you know, plus being hurt on top of that, you know, really threw us behind, you know, even till now. And we're just so far behind right now, it's unbelievable. We're trying to get things sorted out. We're trying to get us a good game plan going, and it seems like everything we do, nothing's really working. You know, now I'm getting back where I need to be as far as being able to drive a race car, but still yet I've got a lot of a lot of stuff I need to be doing. Right now. It appears though that the program is coming together for Bill Elliott. He runs fourth in the late stages of this Trans South 500, and certainly next week that track that will challenge him physically is going to be Bristol International Raceway, that half mile racetrack in which the speeds have increased in testing to 122 miles an hour for a half mile racetrack. That's about five miles an hour over the track record. Bristol is God's way of telling a race car driver he can't be in good enough shape to drive a race car at Bristol. Man, it's a killer. As we watch these two cars battle for the fourth and fifth position, we mentioned there are six cars in the lead lap. Of course, Harry Gant is the leader. Jeff Bodine running second. Greg Sachs is third. Bill Elliott fourth. Davey Allison fifth. Sterling Marlin sixth. Mark Martin just went one lap down as Harry Gant passed him not too long ago. Al Kowicki is running in eighth place. Ninth is Bobby Hillen one lap down. Tenth is Ricky Rudd. Michael Waltrip is eleventh. And Rusty Wallace is twelfth from 7th through 12th position, all one lap down. 13th is car number 84, who's coming into the pits right now, Dick Trickle. He is two laps down. He'll go further now. And Kim Schrader's in 14th, Rick Wilson 15th, Brett Ladine 16th, Kyle Petty is 17th, and Richard Petty is in 18th. Late Speed has gone three laps off the pace now. He's in 19th. Morgan Shepard is in 20th position. 21st is Dave Marcus. And Terry Levante having a rough day here in the Budweiser Ford. is four laps down in 22nd position. There's the Coors Ford, however. That uh, is in fourth position. The 88 car of Greg Sachs is running in third. And he's not that far back from Jeff Bodine. Only about a second and a half or so back in front of him is Jeff Bodine in second place. So I tell you what, they think they won the race if they went home and with a second place finish. Jerry Punch is in the Greg Sachs pit, Jerry. Well, indeed they would, Benny Parsons. You know, they've had a lot of tough luck in this Crisco team, the Crisco Pontiac, owned by Buddy Baker and Danny Ship. But the big difference to the team, a few weeks ago, they added this man right here, suitcase Jake Elder, the man who has been around a long time, and no one knows how to set up a car for Darlington better than Jake Elder, and he has done a yeoman job. They qualified back in 16th spot, but Jake Elder has done an outstanding job. They are excited about having him on board, and I think Greg Sachs is going to be thanking his lucky stars right now, running second or running third, actually, and running very, very well in the last 45 laps to go. You can see there that he has had a uh, top 10 finish earlier this year, so this could be his second. He was eighth at Rockingham in the race that we televised for you. We saw, we saw J.C. Elder. When I won the Trans South 500, he was the crew chief that sent my car up. And Jerry Bunch, you're right. He knows how to set up a car for Darlington. As we watched Jeff Bodine 
I don't see the tire smoke that I saw just a moment ago, so he's probably run a little bit slower and not spinning the tires or pushing as bad as he was a moment ago. Notice a little bit of tire smoke at times, but uh, not all the time. Jeff in second position. Tell you what, I think Waddell did, a, did his work today as the crew chief role because he brought NASCAR's attention to the fact that, hey, that uh, we're, we have been cheated out of a lap. He brought their attention to it, and finally they rechecked and said, you're right, and gave him his lap back. You notice that Jeff got up way up high there in turns one and two and came close if he didn't slightly scrape the ball. And that seems to be uh, the way things have gone generally all weekend. Uh, that first and second turn has seen a lot of cars get up there and put a little uh, paint on it. And a pretty treacherous turn. And uh, again, this time of the day, when you go into turn one looking into the sun, and then all of a sudden you go into some shade over there as you start coming off of the turn, and it, it makes it tough to see. The windshield is very pitted by now. And in fact, you can see there the glare and the, the, how the windshield is pitted. You don't have the clear vision that you had at the beginning of the race as we look out the valve lane car of Morgan Shepard. You can see up in front of him the Marshall Walter Hill, a 50 pound lemonade car. Follow Morgan around the track here a little bit to see he backs off to go into the turn and he accelerates. This is coming off of uh, turn four now. Now he's heading down the back stretch right now. Get the turn straight out here. Now he's driving in the sun in turn one. Now see how the glare is right there. We can probably sit better from the camera than you can from inside the race car. Yeah, it just almost blinds him there for a moment. Harry Gant, car number 33, leads the Trans South 500 with 324 laps completed. Gant has led this race since lap 188, and we are at lap number 325. The top 10 as we take another break here at Darlington. We'll show you that uh, Harry Gant is in the lead. Second is Bodine, third Sachs, fourth Elliott, and in fifth spot is Davey Ellison. We'll see you again. We're about to go back to racing after a caution period brought out by some debris. Now, let me explain what has happened here. Because we ran over so long, and mainly because of that long yellow period while uh, some NASCAR uh, scoring questions were sorted out, we had to change transponders and even satellites. So we had to go off the air for a while, and that's why we went to tennis. We hope you enjoyed the tennis that we brought to you. But now we're ready for the finish of the race, and there are less than 20 laps to go. The top five with 349 laps completed here at Darlington show Harry Gant in the lead with Jeff Bodine running second, then Bill Elliott, Davey Allison, and Greg Sachs. All have come in four pit stops during this most recent caution period caused by, again, debris on the, the uh, front stretch, but now we are set up for, hopefully, the finish of this race. And once again, Harry Gant quickly dived down pit road when the caution came out. Alan Kowicki came down with him. Alan missed a golden opportunity to pick up the lap that he is behind, but he came down pit road, and so now he's still a lap down. The green comes out, and the lace race resumes with now 17 laps to go. Harry Gant from Taylorsville, North Carolina, is in the lead. That's Jeff Bodine right on his tail, however, as they come out of corner number two and race down the backstretch. And although Harry Gant has shown the dominance here throughout most of this race and has led for most of it, Jeff Bodine may have other thoughts now as we reach the closing laps. Now, there's the number nine car of Bill Elliott and the 88 machine of Greg Sachs. And there's the 28 car, the Haviland car of Davey Allison. And all these guys are on the lead lap. to third, fourth is Elliott at number nine, and then fifth is Greg Saxon, car number 88. Well, Harry Gant has certainly been dominant for the last couple of hundred miles in this race, and now he's pulled away a little bit from Jeff Bodine as we see the battle for the fourth and fifth positions between Bill Elliott, who's running fourth, and Greg Saxon, car number 88, running in the fifth position. Let's talk about, guys, for just a minute here, what this win is going to mean for Harry Gant, because I'm sure both of you have gone for long. Oh, and Greg Sachs is in trouble, hitting the wall in turn one and gets 
nailed by another car. Hard oh, contact. Everybody spinning and slamming into each other as they go into the turn. Apparently a lot of oil put down by Greg Sachs' car, plus the blindness going into that turn. The fact that the sun is in their eyes, and you can see the Greg Sachs car in the center of the screen. I think that's a Kenny Schrader car that, uh, that hit Greg Sachs. I, I can't tell he's up in the... Yes, it is Kenny Schrader. And there was another car there in the uh, middle of the racetrack that also was involved. Boy, Greg Sachs, look at that car. You can see him moving around in there. He apparently is okay, but that car took a real serious hit. And there is Ken Schrader, who also went hard into the wall and into Sachs. I hope that Kenny is okay. And the entire field of cars is going down on the apron of the racetrack because there's so much debris up where those cars made the collision. And we see Schrader jumping out of his car and getting out of there. Yeah, glad to see that. He took a shot. He sure did. He hit, uh, hit Sacks hard, apparently got back into the wall as well. And before that accident occurred, you can see the left side of that car, and the paint had almost been entirely taken off anyway, and now there's considerably more damage than that. Right, Here's a replay. Okay, Greg, Greg Sachs moves down to the inside. You can see the smoke. He, he knew he had trouble right then. He moved down to the inside of the racetrack and slid back up in front of Ken Schrader. Then we see other cars coming. There's, I believe, Ricky Rudd's car going. I believe Ricky got through there. I think that's Kyle Petty that stopped in. I don't know who that is on the inside. I think Kyle Petty was also involved in the accident. Okay, uh, the number eight car, Bobby Hillen Jr. was involved, as was Rick Wilson in car number 42 and Kyle Petty. Another angle replay of the crash. Here comes the, uh, the hitting. And watch the yellow car. Of, Ooh, of, uh, Rudd slams on the brakes yeah. and slides all the way through. There's Hillen. No, that's Dick Trickle. Yeah. He's and uh, Rick Wilson also made contact with, I believe, uh, Greg Sachs as uh, he came spinning down into turn number one. Here's how it looked from Morgan Shepard's point of view. The Valvoline Pontiac, he sees the smoke in front of him trying to get his car slowed down. And you can see that there's just not much that he can see as he goes into that turn. Then he loses vision completely. Now he sees another car come in front of him, and he tries to go high on the racetrack, trying there's to Rick. find a clear spot. There's Rick Wilson spinning on the inside of him. And he made it through. Yep. Geared her down. You can see him put it up into <laughs> third gear as he went into that turn. Here's Greg Sachs walking and Kenny Schrader walking back up through there. Of course, Greg telling him what happened. Two of the drivers involved in this crash walking away from it. Now we have yet another angle of this crash, and this perhaps will uh, give you a better indication of what happened. Just at the start-finish line, something happens on the uh, Greg Sachs car as he was behind Bill Elliott. We see the smoke coming out of the exhaust, which is an indication that something is broken inside the engine, and it starts coming out the exhaust pipe. Greg, in trying to get the, out of the competitor's way and get out of the groove of the racetrack, drives down on the apron of the racetrack. Here's a real-time replay for Morgan Shepard's car. Let's listen to what happened. On the brakes hard. Now, which way do I go, left or right? Man, maybe. Who am I good or what? <laughs> he survived. That's you what he hear, You can hear him running over uh, some of the debris that have been scattered down there. Again, there's Greg Sachs, who started the incident, and Ken Schrader walking right behind him. Both of them are okay, but that was our most serious crash of the afternoon, and it came with about 15 laps remaining. You can see that he's being interviewed there by one of the Motor Racing Network reporters, and there is the battered Folgers machine of Kenny Schrader, but he is okay, already climbed out of it, and is walking himself to the pit area. So it's going to be quite a while before this debris is cleaned up down in the turn one and two area. In the meantime, another break. We'll be right back. Hundred from Darlington Raceway in South Carolina, a race that's being led right now by Harry Gant from Taylorsville, North Carolina. Today's Speed World coverage is being brought to you by your local Yamaha dealer featuring the all-new FCR 600 motorcycle. Yamaha, we make the difference. By Quaker State Motor Oil, the big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And by the first name and filters, Purolator, exceptional protection for exceptional vehicles like yours. 
A crash down in turns one and two. The crew still doing the cleanup. Now Jack Aroot in the pit area is with two of the principals involved in this accident, Jack. Well, first let's talk to Greg Sachs, who actually precipitated the accident. Greg, an engine let go. Yeah, Jack, he had an engine did let go. And, uh, I feel something bad for AC and Crisco, Mobile One, Pontiac. You know, the, the car was working so well. And it's all a tribute to my new crew chief, Jake Elder. He's done a fabulous job. And I know that everybody can expect more of this to come. We're going to get out there. We're going to win some races. I'm just glad that, you know, when the engine expired, no one got hurt behind us. And you're okay. I'm fine. Now, the guy that took probably one of the wilder rides that actually did a little bumper tag with the guy on my right is Kenny Schrader. Kenny, that was a wild ride at Darlington. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, stuff happens here so quick. And we went down in there. Greg blew up. And I thought maybe he was going to get her gathered up on the bottom. And uh, I went ahead and committed to go around top. And then he just came back across the racetrack. There's nothing he could do. Now, not to make light of what happened, but these are two old open-wheeled racers, and they made the long walk back to pit road. All they kept doing is talking with their hands, saying, man, I thought I almost had it. Yeah, well, I thought I almost had it as well. It was hard to believe that they had crashed at 170 miles an hour. And it was a tough shot, I'll tell you. Both of them took hard hits, and we'll replay this once again. As you can see, the cleanup is continuing. They're bringing some extra equipment, as a matter of fact, on the racetrack to expedite this cleanup procedure. Now, here's a replay. There we see Sachs coming off turn four. Bill Elliott, the car right in front of him. Sachs is singing about drafting by. He starts by, and just as he starts to pull out, right there, the engine lets go. We see the smoke coming out. He moves down to the bottom of the racetrack, and he's going too fast when he gets down in the grip. Plus, there might have been some oil that did get under the wheels. He shoots back across the racetrack, directly in front of Ken Schrader, who had no place to go. And we see... Kyle Petty gets tagged. That's not Kyle. That Rick Wilson. I that believe got it was Rick there. Wilson. Yeah, he yeah. went sliding yeah. through and, and got hit a couple of times. But Kyle Petty was uh, the, also involved in it. The stop, the car nearest to us was Kyle Petty. And there is his car now. Is it on? Is it on the hook? Going back into the garage area. So some drivers that were having some very good runs here this afternoon are out of it now as a result of this accident. And we get down near the end of this race, Bob. There's only about. Uh, what, less than 10 laps to go. Well, just as that accident was occurring, I was about to ask both of you guys what this race means to Harry Gant. You probably both have been involved in long dry spells in which you didn't win a race for two, three years, and now Harry Gant appears to be in a position to win for the first time since 1985. Is he going to be an easier person to get along with, you think, Ned? <laughs> well, you know, it's been amazing how Harry Gant has handled the situation over those years. Uh, all of the disappointments that he's had, he still has been an easy person to talk with. But I'll tell you one thing that it'll do for his team, it puts him on the winner's circle plan. Mm -hmm. And that means a lot of dollars. Hey, that's right. I had forgotten all about that, but you're right. It's worth about $7,000 for the remaining 25 races of the year. So that's not, nothing to uh, sneeze at. But Harry Gant, personally, yes. Because I'm sure that when he had all the troubles the last couple of years, not just last year, but the year before that, when he had all those troubles, People looked at Harry again and said, he's too old to drive a race yep. car. He can't drive a race car. Why don't he quit? Never going to win again. Never going to win again. I'm sure they're saying the same things about Richard Petty. And <laughs> I know that Richard Petty, the relief that he's going to feel when he wins 201. <laughs> yeah, and you know, while the people were saying that about Harry again, he was going out there on Saturday afternoon and winning some of those Bush Grand That's National right. races. So yeah. he, he was still proving that he could drive a race car. And he's yeah. certainly proving it here today. You know, that's the thing. At Harry Gant, when he goes in the racetrack, when he checks in Bristol, his head's going to be just a little higher. <laughs> and even though he's still limping from that accident in Charlotte, he's going to, his step is going to be just a little further than it was before. It's two or three inches more. Well, we... Wait, he still hasn't won the race. Well, that's but, true, yeah. And we are going to get some green flag laps in, I believe, because some of the cleanup crew has moved away from the crash site down in turns one and two. There are some machines down there, but I think we're going to have a few laps of green flag racing. And the question is, can Harry Gant hold on to the lead? Oh, my car's not... ...of ESPN Speed World, and again, a reminder that as soon as we conclude this race, and we are near the conclusion of it right now, seven more laps to go, we'll go down to Florida for the Lipton Players Challenge Tennis with Cliff Drysdale and Mary Carrillo. The top guys now are Harry Gant in the lead. Second place is the number five car of Jeff Bodine. In third is Sterling Marlin. Fourth is Davey Allison, and fifth is Bill Elliott. Sterling Marlin... 
this year an 11th and a, a 7th, a 5th, and an 8th place finish, putting him 4th in the point standings. And now, if the race were to end right away, he would be 3rd at the conclusion of this race. And here's another guy that has been very consistent this year and therefore in the real battle for the Winston Cup. Yeah, new sponsor on the car, uh, Sunoco sponsoring that car this year. He has a new crew chief. As a matter of fact, he and Greg Sachs traded crew chiefs. It wasn't planned that way, but it worked out that way. Jake Elder was a crew chief on Sterling Marlin's car at the beginning of the year. He was released, so he went over to Greg Sachs, and uh, Daryl Bright was the crew chief on Greg Sachs' car. He went over to this car number 94, so they just uh, traded jobs. You know, you longtime Winston Cup fans wonder, well, I thought he drove car 44. He did last year. You see the number 94 on the car. That has something to do with the octane of the gasoline yeah. in Sunoco or something. A That's new, uh, why a, they changed the... A new higher octane gasoline was introduced, and it has 94 octane, and therefore that's the reason why the 94 is on the side of the car. Jeff Bodine, meanwhile, is in the second position, and Waddell Wilson, the crew chief on this car, is with our Jack Aroot. Well, WW got the scoring all straightened out. Now can you get the lead straightened out? I mean, do you have enough with Jeff Bodine to take over this lead? No, I'll tell you, Harry's car has really run good all day. Going through the corners and down the straightaway, and he's on the good years, and from, you know, when they give us a green, I know that they're going to be tough. We're on the Hoosiers, which they fit our car better, and that's the reason we're on them. But it takes a few laps for them to come in, and right now we're hoping to hold off the cars behind us. So really, he's going to try and settle for second, but the man that's in the pit crew and has been with them all day that hopes that they'll score their first win is Jerry Punch. Doc, take it away. Well, I'm with Andy Petrie. This young man grew up about uh, 15 miles from Harry Gant's home and grew up watching Harry run the short tracks at Hickory and worshiping this guy. Now he's a crew chief for Harry Gant. And Andy, you can't be too upset about all these caution laps, can you? Well, it can, uh, it can work both ways on you, Jerry. You know, if they go all the way under caution, naturally, I wouldn't mind that. But if, if we happen to get jumped on the start, it, we need probably need a few laps to catch back up and, and maybe win the race. But, you know, it can work both ways. Well, Harry Gant's talking back and forth to his crew, pointing out every small fleck of metal he can find up in turns one and two. And they're passing along the NASCAR to make sure that track is nice and clean before they drop the green here at Darlington. And, Jerry, one thing that all of those cars in front, there are five cars in the lead lap now. Harry Gant, Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, Davey Allison, and Bill Elliott. Only Bill Elliott has made a pit stop. He had nothing to lose. He came in, put on four new tires. Wonder, those other four guys has to be wondering, did I run through debris? Have I cut a tire? They won't know that until that green flag drops. Now, you've seen them. They wiggle their cars back and forth. And, Benny, I'm sure one thing they're trying to do is to see if they have a low tire or if they can feel it. Well, that's they're doing two things, Ned. And the, the first thing that they're trying to do is, yes, we see Alan Kowicki. That's what we're talking about, weaving the car back and forth. Also, Mark Mart behind it. Harry Gantz weaving his car. They're asking, they're trying to feel if they have a slack tire. Also, they're wiping the the sand and debris off those tires. The and rubber that they picked up uh, during... Speaking of debris, there's still some on the racetrack. Our cameras have that picked it up. Like it could be just a piece of paper, though, which creates no problem. But all of that debris that was caused from the accident down there in turn number one involving Greg Sachs and uh, Ken Schrader and others has been cleared away. And now we get set to go racing again. 363 when the green flag comes out. And there will be four more laps of racing. Well, what will those new tires do for Bill Elliott? He's in fifth place back there. Good move on his team's part to bring him in, put those four new tires on it. Could pick him up a position or two, or who knows how many. So we'll see what happens with Jeff Bodine and whether Waddell Wilson's comment uh, holds true, and that is he becomes as much as, no. we're going to go, uh, we're going to stay well, under I, caution. I think that piece of metal that we saw bouncing out from some of the other cars down towards turn one, it is being picked up now by one of the officials, and has now you can see him running back to the infield, but uh, they're holding up one more lap because of that. Elmo Langley driving the pace car for the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, and now Harold Kinder, the official starter, signals one more lap to go. The lights on the top of the pace car are turned out when uh, they will be going back green the next lap. So there will be only three more laps of racing. That's about the sixth time I've ever been when I you know, felt like I had to race one and it was going to end on the caution flag or it was going to rain or something, and it didn't happen that way. <laughs> they, 
threw the green flag back, and me knowing I'm going to get beat as soon as they throw the green flag back. But Harry Gant, maybe he has enough confidence in his car right now that he doesn't have that sick feeling that his dog just died or something. Well, I tell you, that car has been running awfully strong here for the last, I'd say at least the last 300 miles, and unless something goes wrong here on the restart and all these few laps, he should have it. The cars are at the end of the back stretch, going into the banking between turns three and four. Lined up to the inside of Harry Gann is the lap car of Alan Kowicki. Behind Kowicki is the Mark Martin pole sitting car. And then Rusty Wallace. All those guys are a lap down. Only five are on the lead lap at the moment. One thing Harry Gant wants to do is to beat Alan Kowicki into the first turn. If he can do that, he's going to be in good shape. If he doesn't, he's going to, it's going to be tougher for him to stay out there. And here we go. The green flag is out. There are three laps to go in the Trans South 500. And Kowicki is hanging right in there. As a matter of fact, taking Harry to the wall in turn number one. Both survive, however, as they go down the back stretch. Now Harry again is going to stay high on the racetrack, and let's see what happens as they go into turn number three. Yeah, Harry's going to get him. Yeah, Allen gave him running room. That was a, the, a very gentlemanly thing to do, that he put him in position that he should be able to hold off Jeff Bodine. And he's doing the same thing for Jeff Bodine, it appears. Here comes Bodine. That's Mark Martin on the inside of the track. He is a lap down. Sterling Marlin coming around there in third. Well, that's what Al Wicke had to race to keep Mark Martin from passing him. So he has to, that's a uh, position that they're racing for. Oh, Kowicki gets loose coming off the corner. Martin goes by. <laughs> three abreast down the back straightaway. Woo. What a scramble going into turn number three. They get sorted out, however, and now Davey Allison in car number 28 has moved into third position and will challenge Jeff Bodine for second. And Rusty Wallace and Er... <laughs> Kowicki almost loses off the corner as he tries to hold off Rusty Wallace. White flag. One more lap for Harry Gant. One more lap to go for Harry. He's got a comfortable lead as the cars come off of corner number two and down the back stretch. There he is, but the real battle's for second position. And Davey Allison, it appears, is going to have second. Yes, indeed, he's past Jeff Bodine at the end of the back stretch. And Davey Allison is now in second position. Jeff Bodine in the number five car is in third. Here comes the end of the race, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be Harry Gant winning his 10th Winston Cup career win. And in second position is Davey Allison. Third is Jeff Bodine. And Harry wins his first Winston Cup race in September of 1985. Congratulations, Harry Gant. That's what Davey Allison's saying. Jeff Bodine. Jeff Bodine. Waddell Wilson called it there. He said, we just hope that we can hold off the guys behind us. Yep. He was not able to hold Davy Allison off the, the Jeff Bodine car. He just simply couldn't do it. And don't get me wrong. Every driver in this race wanted to win today. We see Rusty Wallace. Every driver wanted to see. Now, here, look, look at this. The three abreast in the back. Kawicki on the outside. Wallace on the inside. Bill Elliott tried to make it three abreast. And here's Davy Allison. Coming off that second corner, great bite alongside. And yeah. almost clears him down the back straightaway. Yeah, Jeff's car slipped just a little bit coming off turn two over there, and, and Davey had a good run coming off the corner and just shot on past him. I think the point that you wanted to make, Benny, was every single individual driver wanted to win the race, but I think they're all kind of happy for Harry. They, if they couldn't win, I don't think there's anybody there that has any animosity at all towards Harry Gant winning the race. Every one of them stopped and congratulated Harry and said, hey, way to go. A long dry spell has come to an end, just like we had a, a streak ended last week when uh, Richard Petty failed to make the race. Here comes the old veteran Harry Gant back to win his first since 1985. And again, we talk about what we mentioned at the very top of the program. When we started this race, we had some young guys averaging 31 years of age up front. Mark Martin, Brett Bodine, Alan Kowicki, and Davey Allison. But on this racetrack, it's experience that counts, and an experienced veteran showed it today. And not only experience getting around the racetrack, but experience in setting the car up to run 500 miles, knowing exactly what it takes to run 500 miles. We kept talking about Skoll as a sponsor. That is a Skoll Bandit car, but also Harry has a couple associate sponsors. He's yeah. also sponsored by Food yeah. Line and Detroit Gas. Yeah. Let's get those sponsors yeah. in. 90 races between wins. And Harry Gant's crew walks to victory lane as 
the Gantt car is already there, and this should be quite a celebration. No, he, for... he went by the yeah. gas pumps uh, down there, yeah. or maybe just trying to find his way to Victory Lane. <laughs> He's been to Victory Lane here at Darlington before, but I think he went by the gas pumps to fill the car up with gas, and uh, then it's going on down, and that, of course, might have been a requirement by NASCAR if they do that in many racetracks. Now Harry Gantt is pulling into Victory Lane. And although we haven't figured the points specifically, we believe that Alan Kowicki is going to take over the Winston Cup points lead, and Earnhardt will go to second, and Sterling Marlin will uh, move into third position in the Winston Cup standings. So Harry Gant is getting the helmet off and uh, wiping the sweat off of his face. What a tremendous victory this afternoon. Well, our Sears Die Hard winner's interview is being brought to you by America's best-selling replacement battery, the Sears Die Hard. Let's go to Victory Lane. Well, you can hear the applause and the big smile on Harry Gannon getting that, getting that injured leg out of there. Harry, partner, it's been four years and 90 races. Welcome back to Victory Lane. The bandit is back. <laughs> they got to reckon with us from now on. You know, we had a... Uh, Andy and Leo Jackson and all our crew, they've done a super job today in this Oldsmobile, a Rocket 88. Yeah, they've done a good job today, boy, I tell you, it ran this super. And we've done good pit stops, and, uh, you know, I'm just glad we won this early. New team. <laughs> well, this right here is a guy that's been on your back for four years, they're telling me, and you get, you get the pleasure of throwing this monkey away. You've had the monkey, and he's gone. <laughs> the monkey is gone from Harry Gantz back. Harry, your, your heart had to skip a beat those last uh, 20 or 30 laps with all the yellow flags. No, not really. The uh, only time my heart skipped a beat there was when they started letting all the cars go around the racetrack and make their laps up free. <laughs> I sat in there and I said, don't get mad. Just like stroke race, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get mad. <laughs> I just raced the track all day. I didn't run real hard. Uh, Earnhardt, Rusty, a lot of cars got in the wall. And I just stayed down a little way from the wall and I tried to save the tire. The trick today was saving the tires. And, you know, Andy had the right set up on the car. And, you know, we got to thank Oldsmobile, Skoll and Detroit Gaskets, and Goodyear done a good job here today, and we're tickled with them, too. Again, Harry Gant in Victory Lane winning the 33rd annual Trans-South 500. The monkey is gone, and the bandit is back. Gentlemen? And the top five finishers after Harry Gant finishing in second position was the number 28 car of Davey Allison. Third was Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin.